Today, you're going to be seeing over 50 presentations of the best, the absolute best, that our educators, students, and school districts have to offer from over 24 school districts. We want to thank each of you for spending time with us today. So we look forward to sharing this time and opportunity with each of you. Hello, my name is Bernadette Carpenter. I'm the Learning Innovation Lead here at KVEC, and this is our 16th Fire Summit. Thanks to all of the teachers and students and administrators that took part in the Learning Innovation Grants, and thank you for stepping out and doing what's good for kids. Hi, welcome. I am Cindy R. Tripp from Deaf Allen Central Elementary and I'm the art teacher and our project was Animating Art. Animating Art, our educational problem was students were complaining that art history was kind of boring, so I wanted to be able to give them a new and inventive way to make art history more interesting. So some of our questions was, what methods could I implement to make art, learning art history more fun? How can I successfully implement and incorporate STEAM with art? What products are available to incorporate STEAM into my art class? And how can students bring their artwork to life? And how will I access what my students have learned? My plan of action was um, how I helped make learning art history more fun. Students were able to select a favorite artist and recreate their artwork and add um, some hummingbird bit kit encoding with it to make the artwork to come to life. Um, some of the project outlines and implementations was um, that the artwork had to be from a famous work of art, um, be based on, or stand on its own, I'm sorry, <laughs> use an LED or motor or both, uh, and then the constraints was that it has to be no larger than a shoebox and uh, for the students to try to use similar products as what the artist used and then use things found around the home. Here in these images you can see our students working with the Hummingbird Big Kit and their laptops to code and work on their artworks. The resources that we used are the Hummingbird Big Kits from Bird Brain Technologies and then we used access to make code JavaScript and then uh, classroom supplies that we had available, such as cardboard boxes, our printers, and the Hummingbird Big Kits, and some batteries, and some different things that whatever the students wanted to use. So who has been involved and how? So we, we kind of um, veered a little bit away from the original plan. I was planning on beginning this with eighth grade, but uh, due to some illness closures and uh, weather closures, our schedule has been a little little wonky. So I've uh, been able to implement this so far with several sixth grade students who are interested in a trial project. And we do continue to plan on uh, working on these with different grades and um, different throughout the years just different years and grades. So, so far uh, we implemented this with the sixth grade students who were interested in the trial projects and there have been approximately 30 students that are taking turns with the kits while working in small groups. Our students have been practicing using the make code with JavaScript to program the Hummingbird Big Kits and bring their artwork to life. We didn't get to start on this until late in the third quarter due to the COVID related illnesses and weather closures. Um, and school cancellations. So students did begin working on researching artists and artworks to bring uh, the, their artworks to life and replicate. Students will have recreated a two-dimensional painting as a three-dimensional kinetic art form using various art techniques that are appropriate to their sculptures. And then uh, during the fourth quarter, which is our current quarter, Students are continuing uh, or have begun to learn how to use make code and implement their learning into their artwork uh, using the Hummingbird Robotics Kits. And then some of the students have been able to defend how they chose to incorporate either lights or motors into their artwork. I'm gonna show you a work sample next. So this is a um, student work sample 
by Carly and Loretta, who are sixth grade students. They recreated Keith Haring's dancing figures, and um, we're going to demonstrate a little video of how they did that and what they used. And uh, you'll see that their mission was successful in creating a uh, artwork that meted the, cr the criteria. Keith Allen Haring was an American artist whose pop art emerged from the New York City graffiti subculture of the 1980s. His animated imagery has become a widely recognized visual language. Our project is based off Keith Haring's dancing figures. We used a hummingbird kit and microbit maker code, wall coding as well as two position servo motors and program the two figures to move side to side. Now we will demonstrate what it does. Those girls were really excited about their project, and they were they were excited when they finally turned on that uh, on off switch, and their little figures started moving, and they were really excited. All right, another student work sample is Matthew Strom's Young Man Reading at Candlelight. Uh, these girls were sixth grade students as well, McKenzie and Kansas. Um, and unfortunately, they're unable to do a demonstration because um, when we were scheduled to do it, one of them were absent and the other one wasn't comfortable doing it on her own. But um, they were happy for me to share their work and they used the yellow LED light. Um, they found this image online and uh, they printed it and mounted it to a board uh, because they were kind of under a little time constraint. So. They, they pretty much, they met the criteria of uh, adding the LED to create the flame and they programmed it to flicker. So if I had a video of this, you would see that the light flickers a little bit. And uh, they used the Make Code Micro Bit Block Coding and Hummingbird Kit as well. So this is a project that we were really excited and happy with. I love how the, the light looks illuminated on the face anyways. And that just kind of brought it out and brought it to life. Um, a summary of our project. So students have been excited to learn how to animate their artworks. They have been eager to research and plan their project. The plan is proving to be successful in making art history much more fun for students. And I do plan to continue to implement this as a regular part of my art history curriculum with my middle school students. I may change um, the future lessons when I begin implementing it early, uh, a little bit earlier into the school year. Um, this will help avoid delays in progress. And now that I have the kits on hand and continue to reuse the products and the kits, it'll be much easier in making learning our history more fun and more innovative. This is my contact info. You can email me with any questions at cindy.artrip at floyd.kyschools.us or call the school at 606-358-9420, extension 3362, with any questions that if you need any information about our project. Thank you for joining us and have a great day. I'm Andrew Baldwin, and my project was the outdoor greenhouse classroom. Wanted to know how will creating an interactive classroom show an increase of test scores from a pretest to a post test score uh, with that data while ob also observing the data, such as individual journal entries that the students kept and data collected through a log of hours and student surveys. Um, first thing we had to do was to establish a baseline to see how well the students were going to be able to grow. So I have a pretest that is a standardized type test similar to the K-PREP that the students are going to take, just a general science knowledge test, and then they're going to take that again um, once the project was completed. So they take the test along with a control group that does not uh, work with the plants. We have a group of farmers and a, and a control group. Students decided uh, what plants they wanted to try to plant. 
and then they started those plants indoors um, had to get things ordered get things set up and so we did most of that in the classroom got our materials ordered and uh, got uh, got that stuff taken care of from Lowe's um, got the fresh potting soil that uh, that is purchased to help foster the new plants to grow um, we also had to make uh, use of some tools uh, that we purchased and things that we brought from home I even brought a, a drill from home and we lost that uh, it, it got damaged um, things happen uh, kids had a good time they learned some things uh, in this process and we're going to continue to uh, utilize those types of things and we finally got some growth um, the kids uh, did enjoy this they enjoyed seeing things that they took care of and nurtured grow um, not every kid gets that opportunity the post test which came up recently was the exact same test just a standardized test we graded it kept track of the grades and uh, control group took a test and so did the uh, farmers uh, test results showed a growth in both the control group and the farming group which is going to happen a couple of reasons uh, one reason is is that the uh, kids all saw the material once before and not only that they may be able to reactivate some of that prior learning or they may see that in the classroom during the school year so they kind of have it on their mind already uh, however the growth for the farming group was larger by almost two percent so uh, on average your your farming group did grow more than did the control group uh, when taking this test um, thought that was pretty good results uh, one interesting thing with the time log, the log of their uh, days to see how much time they spent working with the plants, the kids that spent the most time had the most growth. They actually grew almost 3% higher than did the uh, students that were farmers. Uh, that was versus the control group. So just a regular farmer, kids that went out and, and worked some, grew about 2%. The kids with the highest total, they grew almost 3%. We also did a student satisfaction survey where we asked them what they thought about it. Did it, did it affect you? Did it, was it positive? Was there no impact? Uh, would you want to do this again? Those types of things. And uh, kept it all anonymous so the kids didn't feel like they were being pressured. And um, believe it or not, 85% said that they love the project. Um, that's pretty common with kids, teenagers. Uh, we're dealing with eighth graders, 14, 15 year old kids. Some of them think it's, you know, they don't want to fool with it or they don't want to get their hands dirty or don't want to put the iPhone down or the, the laptop down or whatever it is that they're, they're fooling with. But the majority of them said that it had a positive impact on their uh, overall experience uh, academically so we're pleased with those results and we're going to continue using um, the materials and see what how we can grow I like some of the ideas um, from my feedback um, I have reached out to um, uh, a local guy we did talk to some local farmers it's kind of hard to do that with COVID and everything um, through the winter. That really set us back on a lot and um, changed our schedule a little bit. But uh, talked to some local farmers, and next year we're going to incorporate that. Um, did talk to one, um, and, and I think we're going to incorporate it with all classes because we see that it's a benefit. Um, even the kids that say they didn't like it or didn't have a benefit or didn't have an impact, they probably got something out of it. And they're going to get something out of it. It's socialization, it's hands-on, it's exercise, it's walking up and down the steps, out the halls, uh, those types of things. And the more they see this kind of stuff, that's that's what our, uh, we don't have an FHA, we have 4-H. Uh, we have, uh, we're real close to West Virginia, so I have some outreach uh, over there. 
um, with some of their programs. And their big thing is teaching kids that you can grow your food and grow sustainably and um, feed yourself. Uh, maybe not necessarily getting all the protein you need or all the meat that you need, um, but that you can do this and it's doable and you can actually make money at it. There was a farmer that uh, that he was telling me about that the year that he passed away, he passed away two years ago in the fall, just before COVID, and he made $82,000 on his local farm. Um, basically just him and his wife and family and that's a lot of money uh, especially pre-COVID a lot of money and so we want these kids to be able to reach out and do these types of things in the future so uh, overall I think it was a great experience um, look forward to hearing some feedback thank you guys Investigation of Changes in the Globe Using System Toolkit SDK and ImageJ Program by Lindsay Phillips and Bailey Howard. So research focus. Used, we used SDK tools to predict the date and the time of the satellite positions at the Northern Hemisphere. Obtained the satellite data and images of the snow and ice sheets in the Northern Hemisphere. We used ImageJ tools to predict the amount of snow from 2011 to 2020 to observe the anomalies due to climate change. Analysis provided the depletion of snow in the northern hemisphere due to climate change. Predicting the satellite's position and time. We worked together on the SDK tool system to get accustomed to the features in the program, and we learned to use the customizable do toolbars, dockable maps, and 3D graphic windows. Each program has unique features that enabled us to manipulate and control the software to get results of our mission. And these are actual pictures we took from our mission as we use the SDK. This is a video. So predicting the satellite's position. Using the SDK toolkit, we designed a satellite, the GSAT-1, with orbital parameters given in this table that passed the Northern Hemisphere. To focus a place on the Earth, we used Greenland so that one can find the date and the time of the crossing point. The red lines in the figure show the path of the satellite. So as you can see here, here's the little red lines and show where our satellite has crossed. Predicting the satellite's position and time. Once the geosat, our satellite's parameters are fixed and the place and the place on the ground, which is Greenland, is set for viewing the satellite, is set for viewing the satellite is fixed. Using the access menu on SDK GUI, we were able to find the time of the satellites passing through the northern hemisphere, which is given in this table to the to the side. Our focus is to find the anomalies in the snow in the norma northern hemisphere from January 1st, 2011 to January 31st, 2020. So these are all of our numbers, and as you can see, we got um, dates throughout that time frame. So this is our data from satellite observations. From the prediction of position and time using the SDK toolkit, we were able to get data from Global Snow Lab at Rutgers University. The data of the snow cover was obtained from different agencies extending from 1966 to 2021. This is shown here in the figure. The anomalies in the northern hemisphere snow is explained in the next slide. So here as you can see here is the data that we collected. This is the analysis of the satellite maps using ImageJ software. The Northern Hemisphere snow chart for January, June, and October months for the years 2011 through 2020, we obtained this from the U.S. National Ice Center. Image J program was used to find the area of the snow covered in um, kilometers squared for the months of January 1st to January 31st. I mean, for the month of January from the 1st through the 31st for 2011, and it's shown in this figure. Our scale was one pixel per um, 55 kilometers 
the threshold is a minimum of 199, maximum 290, 249 to get the snow features for this analysis. So these are our numbers and this is the picture we use to analyze and we, this is us using ImageJ software. This is the analysis of the satellite maps using the ImageJ software. Here's a video. So you can see, I'll play it again, so you can see the um, snow changing over time. So here's the analysis of the satellite maps using ImageJ software. Discrepancies is due to analyzing the chart versus direct microwave data from the satellite. The trend in the anomalies remain the same. So as you can see in our chart here, it remains close to the same for the month of January. And in each year, it stays constant. This is the analysis of the satellite maps using ImageJ software. Discrepancies is due to analyzing the chart versus the direct microwave data from the satellite. The trend and the anomalies remains the same, which shows that we proved our data from using two different sources and we got the same information in both. And these are our numbers and these are the two charts with the um, snow and the data from Rutgers University. So here you can see that we built a transmitter and receiver circuit to show how signals are transmitted from the ground station to the satellite and how it receives the signals and perform the task. We have built a one channel transmitter and receiver circuit using the following components. We used a 433 MHZ RF transmitter and receiver, push buttons, light emitting diode, this is LED, 47K and 407 resistors, five volt power supply from the Arduino kit, a breadboard and connecting wires. And here's the video. Conclusion. Using STK tools and the date, the date and time of the satellite position at the Northern Hemisphere, we was able to achieve. Approach Na NASA agency and obtain the satellite data and images of the snow cover in the Northern Hemisphere. We used ImageJ tools to predict the amount of snow from 2011 to 2020, and we observed the changes in anomalies due to climate change. The analysis provided the depletion of snow in the Northern Hemisphere due to the climate change. And here's another video showing the amount of ice change. These are their references. So here's our acknowledgement. We would like to acknowledge all the members in the KVEC organization for providing funding through the innovation grant to carry out this project. We also like to thank our administ administration for allowing us to work on this project. We also would like to thank Eric Smith in the STEAM lab for his help in troubleshooting the constructed transmitter and receiver circuit. Thank you. Thank you. project is nanocrystalline dissensor solar cells. My name is Mason Lambert, this is Carol Cole, and this is Madison Slaughter. Um, the importance of our work is, so our work will be able to be used in uh, classroom settings. We will be able to help us, or use this to help uh, students uh, learn electricity a lot better. Uh, they can learn how electricity is created from the use of our solar cells because of the solar energy. And it can also be used in uh, poorer areas. They can use this as a very cheap way of creating electricity for themselves. Okay, our materials used. 
In order to create each cell, we use some sort of fruit. We started off using berries. Then we use our cathode and anode conductive glass slides. And we use a iodine electrolyte solution at the end. Um, this is our this is one of our juices right here. It's a cabbage juice. And we actually have to clean the slides with the distilled water. We test it using a uh, light bulb because inside the regular lights do not give it as much electricity as the sun would, so the light bulb does that. And we use a multimeter to actually test the electricity. For procedure, we pretty much follow the same procedure every time. It's just step-by-step -step instructions. The pictures are kind of in order of how we do it. So when we first start off, we take one anode and one cathode glass slide out, and we set them down on the table. And we use a graphite pencil. We had one with our kit, but any graphite pencil will work. We've used different ones previously, and it hasn't changed anything. And on the cathode slide, the one with the white tape at the top, we just scribble with the pencil, just in a like downward motion, back and forth. And then after we get our juice ready, we go on the anode side and we put a little bit of the juice on it, which you can see right here, it's just like a little bubble. And we let it sit for about five, six minutes, just however, depending. And then afterwards is when the distilled water comes in, we rinse it off, like we usually put it in a little cup and just dip it in and rinse it a little bit and then let it sit on a paper towel and dry. And after it's dried, we put both of them together with tape, just tape them together with the top one this way and the bottom one this way, just ends opposite of each other. And after it's taped and secured, we use our iodine electrolyte solution and place it at the top between both slides so it can get in between them. And this is just a picture of after the solution has been in between the slides and been spread around. And after that is when we test it. We usually don't use a phone to test it. It was just easier to get in one picture. But you put both sides of the alligator clamps on each one and then connect it to the multimeter, turn it on. And then we usually test it a minute before we turn the light on and then after just to see what a difference it makes from having fluorescent light to having a light right there on it. The cells, how they work is actually just a similar, just kind of a little step-by-step -step process. The dye is a photoactive material of the solar cells, and it produces electricity once it's sensitized by light, which is where the name comes from, dye sensitized, because the light sensitizes the dye, and that's what kind of starts the whole process. And the way it does that is the dye catches the photons of incoming light, sunlight, artificial light, anything like that and it uses the energy to excite the electrons and they behave like how chlorophyll is in photosynthesis. It's a very similar process. After that, the dye injects the electrons into the titanium dioxide, which is on one of the slides that we put the juice on. There's a slight coating of titanium dioxide on that. And after the electron is conducted away by, nano, by the titanium dioxide, a chemical electrolyte in the cell is, closes the circuit so that the electrons are returned back to the dye. So basically it starts it comes through, goes all the way through, and then whenever it's closed back off, it goes back through, up to here. So it just kind of goes in a big circle. Okay, this is our data. We started off using blueberries, and it was the worst all around. It gave us the lowest voltage. Then we tried raspberries, and it worked good. Then we tried blackberries, and it had the biggest jump in voltage and was the best out of all the berries. After that, we tried red cabbage, and it worked the best and had the most voltage all around. Conclusion and future plans. So we plan to add more cells, like one day we'll get up to 10 cells and hopefully power something bigger testing different juices. We want to test different berries like black raspberries, but we also want to test things that aren't berries like eggplants. Uh, we want to try to power smaller items, so like charging a phone or powering a light bulb and advancing on the technology in school environments. So this could be like for charging Chromebooks. For acknowledgement, acknowledgements, we wanted to thank our teacher, uh, Dr. Hrita Chandran, for giving us the opportunity to do this project to begin with, and of course, Belfry High School, because this is where we conduct most of the project at, this is where we started, this is where we put it together every time. And a big thanks to KVEC, because the grant money that we receive from them is actually how we're able to do any of the projects that we do at all, because they provide a lot of the materials for it. And 
The Ars Institute for Chemical Education is where we actually got the kit from that provided like the specific like the slides and the solution and the pencils and all the things that we actually use when we did it. So a huge thanks to all of them for making this possible. We are adding on to our project with the awards that we have uh, gotten in the past month or so from the competitions that we have attended and our third group in Murray is not here today. In the last month we've attended the regional and state science and engineering fair competitions and from the state competition we got U.S. Agency for International Development Award and ASM Material Education Foundation Award and in our regional fair we won first place in our category overall and uh, that's Geography, Cultivating Empathy for the Earth Award, and we got second place, Best of Fair Award, which is just Best of Fair for the entire competition for all the categories in the high school division. This year in the Belfry High School STEAM class, we have been uh, mentoring new 8th grade students. My name is Mason Lambert, and this is Madison Sloan, and our other two group members are Eric Smith and Joseph Eli. So our area of focus, we had 20 middle school 8th graders that we selected to gain experience and knowledge of uh, STEAM, which is Science, Technology, Engineering, Arts, and Mathematics. The mentorship role enabled us to kind of inspire them and just get kind of a different perspective of what high school is going to be and get them started in the program early. That way they would have a little bit more experience when they started. The 8th graders focused on designing and building robots, learning coding and wiring to operate the robots they built. They synthesized gold and silver nanoparticles using new herbs and available, available in our region for a detection of method of cancer. And by doing this, I believe we've kindled an interest in the students chosen in the same curriculum and kind of a different career path after high school just because they're getting a look into it before the rest of the middle school classes, so they're getting a little bit extra time with it. So the robotic arm project is my group. Um, their names are Victoria, Davlin, Maddie, Ty, and Olivia. Inspiration. Originally, uh, the project was going to be to be able to create a uh, bowling ball or just a ball that we could control. It would have a gyroscope and stuff like that to be able to stabilize it and move forward. And um, we were not able to get all the parts necessary to be able to create this project, so we moved on to something that we'd actually be able to complete, so we made a robotic arm. Um, they succeeded in creating a robotic arm that was able to perform tasks like moving objects and stuff. The students in this group used the Arduino starter kit to be able to uh, learn coding and be able to actually put their coding to actual physical use. Uh, the Arduino kit comes with LEDs, wires, a Ar Arduino board, and a breadboard. This video is just them showing the coding that they have completed after a little bit of So you can really hear it, but in the video they were they programmed the LED lights on the breadboard to be able to light up in a pattern. So the uh, completed robot arm, this video will show you how that arm works. So they had it connected to the Arduino software, which you can see right here on the computer, and that was controlling the robot with the code. The nanoparticles was my group and my project, and the names for my group was Meredith, Justice, Kendall Starr, Riley Johnson, Heather Hatfield, Marielle, Rustar, and Darby Thompson, and then we were doing gold and silver nanoparticles. 
the goal we wanted to achieve with this was using plant extracts to cap the golden sewer nanoparticles. Capping just stabilizes it, so it doesn't inhibit overgrowth. And we're able to test kudzu, sunflower, zucchini, tomato, bitter melon, and a few other things. And we tested those for gold and silver, and only tested for gold with a few different extracts, but we tried to test at least every one with both. And the bottom you can see is the silver, and then the top is what it looks like when we have the gold. And this is kind of what it looks like, the absorbance and wavelength of it. So we recorded UV spectrum of it using a spectrometer in our steam lab, and the absorbance peak at 420 and 450 mediums are the presence of silver nanoparticles, and 520 to 540 is the presence of gold. So when it's closer, back through here, it's for silver, and the further it gets that way, it's for gold. And the use of plants on ex to extract nanoparticles in the future is invasive plants can be used as a capping agent, which also gets rid of plants that are bad for the area or are damaging to the environment as a whole. And the, the nanoparticles can be used to identify cancer cells, which is also just helpful in the medical field and everywhere in the world, really. And we can, in the future, use extract from pomegranate leaves, golden sea leaves, sassafras leaves, spike nerd, cranes bill, and many other things to test to see if we can synthesize golden sewer nanoparticles with those plants. We'd like to thank uh, the principal at the middle school, uh, Mr. Keith May, for giving us the opportunity to bring the students to the high school and actually let them participate in this program for so long. And we want to thank our principal, Mr. Gannon, at Belfry High School for also allowing us to use the same lab to do this. And the funding was provided by KVEC to carry out these projects. And obviously, the mentors, we've been doing a lot this class to try to help them and give them a good opportunity. And we just want to thank the students themselves for actually coming up here and participating, because without them, there wouldn't be a program at all. Hello, this is Kathy Conley from Knott County and Knott County Central High School. And I have a wonderful project that I want to tell the world about. Um, it involves some awesome colored pencils, some awesome notebooks, and a whole bunch of hope, a whole bunch of hope. And so our, my project, our project is called Not in Color, and it's brought to you from myself and students in the room in room 112. And let's just go and see what it's about. Um, the project summary basically is what that tree uh, symbolizes it, is that we, when we came back this school year, um, we wanted to do things to unite us within the classroom, us within the school, and then us within a community because you guys, you know, let's face it, we've been through it. Um, you know, we've, we've faced a lot of uh, hardships in the last year and a half, two years, and I just, um, I talked to the kids and I said, let's, let's do something. Let's do something fun. And so we came up with these objectives. We want to, wanted to bring our school and community together using literacy and art. And who doesn't love art? Who doesn't love coloring, right? Um, and I teach arts and humanities as well as ELA. So that worked out perfectly for me. Um, then we said, well, what do we want to do with, you know, if we're, if we're going to involve community, let's make sure that it's positive and that the activity is going to be therapeutic and helpful, um, help everybody involved. And so when we talked about the fact that we're going to do coloring within it, we researched and found that coloring, old fashioned coloring, like, you know, this kind of coloring, is very therapeutic and it is starting to be used post pandemic um, to help people, you know, like the adult coloring books. And so we said, let's do that. And then we really wanted to enhance our self esteem, my, mine as well, students and, and individuals from our county. And then we wanted to create a lasting document to honor our school and community because we got it going on in Knott County. 
Um, so before I started, I just gave the students a little, it's very, very, very small um, self-evaluation. And it, it just said, how strongly do you feel about these skills? Interviewing, writing, and creating. And then I had to talk to them about creating artistically. And so they just gave themselves um, a number. One is the lowest and 10 is the highest. I noticed on this chart, um, no one gave themselves a 10. And, and for good reason, we all were kind of new at this whole thing. Um, but they just, they said at the beginning, this is how confident they felt with doing this. And so, I, I, and again, I just put student one, two, three, four, five, because I don't want to put student names. Okay, and so then we decided, okay, let's talk about what we should use as our research question. And so we kind of worked together and I kind of scooped up the edges and here it is. How can the creation of a coloring book positively affect the social, emotional, and academic learning within our school and community? And we thought and thought and I said, listen, listen, let's create a coloring book. And let's call it not in color because it's going to be black and white. But when people get it, they're going to get these as well as a gift with it. And they're going to be able to color. And it will no longer be black and white. It will be not in color. Um, and so the first step was students were given these interview notebooks. I have one right here. And they were told to... Um, go and find a person that they wanted to highlight, um, wanted to make feel better, wanted to just give give some, some good feelings to that never, ever, ever get like a heroic award. And so it's kind of like unsung heroes thing. And so the interview notebooks, they were prompted to write 25 questions through 25 pages of this and then the person they interviewed would give a response to those and the person they interviewed had to talk to them so it had to be someone that was living and so they did <laughs> they went out and they found people that in their community um, people that had influenced them in the past people who were just uplifting and 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 just part of the greatness of our county. And so they conducted the interviews. And then they just sat down after the interviews and they took these books and they just flipped through them like, like so. And they just said, I, th I could write this. So they just started just, you know, brainstorming more. What can I say about this person? You know, what do I need to go back and maybe ask them again? Um, you know, what quote can I use? All of that. And so it just it just went with writing. And then afterwards, um, of course, they got to personalize the notebooks. This one is not personalized, but they got a chance to um, make it, you know, attractive for them and make it represent the person who is going to be featured. And so they did. They, they got in there. They jumped in there, they wrote, they questioned, they shared with each other, you know, my individual said this, or, you know, I wonder if I should ask what you asked. And, and I, I, I loved that part of it, the, just the interaction between the kids. And when we started this, we had to wear masks. And so by the end of it, obviously we don't. And it, I think it made a big, a big change in them. And so after we got that far, <laughs> um, it came lots of snow. So we had to just hit or miss on doing this part. Um, but they, they wrote a feature article. And I realized after we got to the computer lab, uh, they didn't really know that much about doing a feature article. So I had to kind of review, reteach some of that. And then they they went went in there and did it. And so, you know, as you can see, it's a group of seniors and 
to all in total, it's 68 seniors. Um, but this is just a few of them. And so once they get started and writing their feature article, they had to um, choose a template or template and learn how to insert pictures with proper captions. And they had to be um, choosy with the pictures. The picture had to highlight or feature that individual in a positive way. And the caption had to be, you know, something catchy and perfect for that picture. And so I, I used some sources with them. I did um, Teachers Pay Teachers. I bought some templates on there and showed them what they look like. And then I also found this other website, as you can see on there. And I told them, I said, you know, just get on and explore and see what you can find. See what you can find and use what works best for you. And so we had some more snow, <laughs> um, but we got back to it. And when we got back, we just had to jump in with both feet and, and just kind of start, start doing the creating part. Um, whether our writing part was polished or not, we, we still had to do the creating part. And so, as you can see in the picture, here's some that just, you know, jumped right into ideas and, the, and they began sharing like artistic, um, like po uh, possibilities. And so, one of the things um, that shocked a lot of them, and it actually shocked me, is there's so many creative apps out there to take a photograph and turn it into a cartoon or or a sketch as you see here and so i just told them to get in there and play with them and see which one they liked and which one would work with the picture they have of their individual and i mean i was just shocked i can't tell you that all of them used all of these because I'm sure they didn't, um, and I can't tell you which ones use particular ones, but all of these were available plus more. And so there they are. And, and this was like the biggest trial and error process ever because I was kind of new at that. And um, some students had never done it and some were like super pro. So basically I became a student for part of this, this section. And um, I helped them and I learned how to do this kind of thing with apps. And so afterwards, after like the, the writing and the, the interviewing, the writing, and then this artsy thing that we, we were working on, I gave them um, a post project um, like survey, basically. It's the same one they took at the beginning, just worded a little differently. And as you can see um, on the graph, it shows the growth from student one, two, three, four, five in categories of interview, writing, and creating. And again, they did self-evaluation. Um, and so, you know, a lot of them, I, I really love the fact that um, the create part just kind of grew. And I, you know, I, I kind of knew that some of them were more creative than they thought they were. But the part that I really um, am most satisfied with and impressed is the interview and the fact that they now have confidence and they want to interview people and they want to be interviewed. So, you know, several have asked, well, let's do something else before the school year ends, you know. And, and I said, you know, use your skills. Use your skills for anything. All right, and so our final task is in progress. And our final task is going to be to take these feature articles and these sketches and put them together and have a book published by a Knott County printer. And so that's in progress. Like I said, we've had map testing and lots of other things that have interrupted, interrupted our last few uh, weeks here of the school year. And so that's our, that's our end task. And there's also another end event. Um, and that is I want to bring all the individuals that are featured in the um, 
not in color book and bring all the students who featured them together for a little um, get together, meet and greet kind of thing. Everybody meets everybody and um, just let them present, let the students present these individuals with a book of their own. And, and also they're going to present them with some colored pencils. So that's pretty much um, it in a nutshell. Um, once we get the final uh, book put together, co uh, front cover, back cover, all of this, I will put pictures on holler.org and I'm hoping to get interviews of students after they see the book. <laughs> and so I'll try to put that on there as well. But um, I thank you very much for tuning in and you know, we're not in color yet. We're gonna get there. Okay, everyone, uh, hello. <clears throat> I am uh, Charles Brendan Hackney. I teach visual arts um, at East Ridge High School in Pike County. Um, this is my second KVET grant. Um, my first one was over 3D printing, hence why I kept the title. Um, so with this one, I wanted to go a step further with the 3D printing process. And I found out that there were actually 3D pins. Um, so the purpose of this, uh, this KVET grant was to get those pins and to kind of introduce my students uh, at a baser level to the 3D printing process. Um, so my proposal was showing the students the connection between art and technology because uh, there seems to be a disconnect in their minds what art and what it could use. Uh, they needed a broader sense um, of what art and technology can do together. Um, so like I said in my previous grant, but most art students consider art to be old pictures and paintings and uh, it never dawns on them that all the technology we use is somehow connected to art, whether it be from classic designs, aesthetics, the devices we use every single day, to cars, whatever. Um, with my last grant, I was actually able to show the students that connection. And it was a big highlight for, uh, for my class and everybody was really curious about it and asked me about it almost on a weekly basis. Um, it really it really blew their minds that the 3D printer and I had one in the art room. Um, they were kind of like, wow, this is not in the computer classes and stuff. And I kind of had to explain to them you know, how we could use this, you know, to create art and stuff. Uh, so it did achieve my goal of showing the students that there were viable and exciting careers uh, with art and jobs that are also connected with technology. So this year's grant, I was going to go a step further with that, newer technology. Um, this techn technology also has the direct connection to the 3D printer. Um, and instead of using a machine with a pre-designed layout, we could make a free-form 3D object and make a build from that and transfer it over, have the 3D printer print it out um, and get to that at a later time. This to me had a strong connection to STEAM um, and a lot of students don't get that in a basic art class, I didn't feel. Um, so the items purchased um, of course, the 3D Doodler pins, which you can see on the screen here, um, they're very nice, very fancy. They cost about $70 a piece. Uh, I would not be able to afford them without the grant. Um, also, the pin filament, which is basically uh, um, plastic. Uh, it's the same used in a 3D printing machine. Um, a lot of people say it reminds them of weed eating string to get you a, a little visual of what it's like. Um, and we also got some paint with the grant, which they could use at, on their products <clears throat> or on their projects after they got finished. So the process, it's much like 3D printers. Um, they have the same parts and processes. The, the pen has an internal heater and extruder that is fed from the top, plastic filament, and the same type uh, that is used in most 3D printers. Uh, it, it works a lot like a hot glue gun. It's continuously feed filament from the top. Um, the difference that it has a fast and slow button, so you have better control than traditional hot glue guns. Um, and the only con that I found, me and my students faced with the pins when they must be always plugged in. You have to have them plugged in. They don't have a battery um, or any internal uh, method to power them. So you can't really go all over the room with them. You have to stay in one spot, which can be a good or bad thing. Um, here's some data that I collected. I gave them a little survey. Um, on SurveyMonkey before trying to make the connection between art and technology. Um, 
most of them had no connection um, with art and technology. Some of them had a little, and and a few of them who were very good digital artists, they had a, a good strong connection. So we did this unit, we did the project, and I gave them a similar survey afterwards asking a little bit more in depth, and most of them had a better understanding and made more connections between those two. Um, so the journey, um, we spent a week on this, a week, well, actually about two weeks, uh, but we went over a unit on 3D printing again and had the students, had the students watch tutorials on YouTube and various sites. They really enjoy um, the videos and from doing the modern classroom project through KVIC beforehand this summer, um, it really helped me speed up the process of getting the 3D materials out, getting them started while they were watching these tutorials um, and them gaining the understanding on their own um, without me having to go over and lecture and lecture and lecture. Uh, so that was a highlight. I would highly recommend the Modern Classroom Project, um, which KVIC also does. Um, so after that, they practice simple objects um, using the 3D pens. Um, think softballs or footballs or flags or something like that. Um, the, the next step up, I found and printed out templates for the students. Um, and they started creating actual 3D objects, building them up with the filament, not just flat 2D uh, surface kind of project. Um, then I had them go further than that. Uh, and they had to do like a 3D build, including more than one side, not just building base to top, um, which is very interesting to see. Here is the first step um, in that process, if you will. Um, they worked with the pins. This is first day kind of stuff, surprised me. Uh, the label they could achieve with them, they had no experience with them before. Um, some had experience and, and had their own 3D pins, but these were a lot better, they said, more advanced, um, and they could do a lot more with them. So here's kind of second day, the step two, students used a template, they were tracing out um, these objects that, that they chose and had an interest in. Um, they were doing more complex objects, and they also freehanded a lot during this, point. you know, they would make their names or uh, butterflies or something like that, which was really cool. Uh, and the step three, um, here is where I had them actually going and building objects in a 3D space. You can see one girl with the mushroom and the dog um, that actually has the four legs in space and the bird cage or the bird and sitting on the uh, <clears throat> kind of stoop kind of thing. Um, those were all built in 3D. Very cool. Um, all the students enjoyed, enjoyed this. They didn't really think that they could get to this step. Uh, they didn't think they could do this complex stuff, you know. Uh, while using art and technology. Um, so here's a student he is going to talk about. Um, uh, using so this 3D is pens. Student, Gabe Farron. He is just now beginning his journey with 3D pens. Gabe, so what have you found out so far about using 3D pens? Uh, 3D pens at the beginning of just finding them can be a little difficult, but <clears throat> once you get used to it, you can make quite a bit. I mean, you could build structures, you could build a uh, template, use templates to make uh, smaller gadgets if you need. Um, you can use them to repair things, possibly. So what's your overall thought on 3D pins so far? 3D pins, they could be... Uh, you like them? You don't uh, like them? Yeah, I like them. I mean, it's just going to take a little time to get used to. Um. <laughs> so um, he was kind of nervous. That was kind of an impromptu little uh, interview I gave him, but I thought he did a good job. Um, so here's what I want to do later on. We didn't really get to it. Uh, I plan on doing it before the, the end of the school year, um, but I kind of haven't uh, gone through the whole process. Uh, so it's my goal at the beginning to get the students comfortable with the pins, which I did, and then able to take that work over to the actual 3D printer um, from the stuff that KB helped me with before. Um, so like I said, we haven't got this step, but I plan on doing it it is to start the 3D process, they would create an object, you say, take it over to um, an HP Sprout computer I have. If you haven't seen them, it has a 3D scanner uh, coming out from the monitor of the computer, and then you have a little platform that you can drop objects onto, and it spins it around, scans it into your computer, um, making the actual 3D file, which is read by 3D printers, and you can take that file, um, smooth it out, render it a little bit uh, better, 
um, before you print it and then print it out and they could take that 3D print and, and actually paint it or continue on, add on to it with the 3D pins, which would be really cool. Uh, so hopefully I'll get that get to that later on. Uh, my conclusions, the students really had fun with this unit. Um, the project, probably more than any project that we've done so far this year, they absolutely loved it. Um, I know it was cliche, but their, their smiling faces made it all worth it, the missteps and mistakes um, that got caught up in the process. But I think more than anything, it got more students to open their eyes about how technology and art can be uh, interrelated and it even solidified to some of them that they have a if they have a passion for art that they can turn this into a career um, I felt like before uh, talking to them they would you know they were going to go to college to do something else and have a minor in art and and now I think that kind of made them think a little bit that maybe if they wanted to do an art career that they could um, and actually make money doing it which is a big difference <laughs> in people having an art degree and actually using it um, but I state this every time I receive one of these grants, they help so much. KVIC helps so much. Uh, the learning innovation grant without it, I wouldn't be able to, to do half the stuff I do in my, my class. And for the bottom of my heart, thank you all uh, that you helped to accomplish in this area. So that's it. Thank you. Hello everybody, um, this is my project, A New Kind of Intelligence. So hi, um, my name is Mark Harmon and I'm a STEM instructor at Ashland Middle School um, in Ashland, Kentucky. Um, for this specific project, my area of focus was student engagement, authenticity, and relevancy. Um, so first off, just in general, it is imperative that we keep students engaged with their content um, when content is outdated, students can become disengaged very quickly. So with STEM, the issue arises then that technology that you feel as though is cutting edge or innovative within a year or two is very quickly outdated. So our job is to continuously strive to stay at the forefront of what that means. So for this project, um, because I'm going to talk about more here in a little bit, I wanted to utilize artificial intelligence to achieve that goal. Um, next up comes authenticity. So if a learning is unable to make a personal connection with students, they very quickly become disinterested, which leads to poor performance. So in the past, I have done units on artificial intelligence before, and that's what it was missing was that authentic component students weren't able to get hands-on quite like they they were in this one um, and then finally relevancy um, it's got to give students that that connection um, as we were kind of talking about with that engagement if it's outdated then very quickly it's no longer relevant and then also with the authenticity if it can't be applied to a real-world situation then that can um, be an issue as well. So for this project, um, my research question was, will the implementation of emerging technologies increase student engagement in the classroom and help encourage them to explore new potential careers? Um, so overarching for this one specifically, we utilized artificial intelligence. But this is something that in the future does keeping the, the curriculum stocked full of emerging technologies really assist um, with keeping students engaged and therefore achieving where we want them to achieve. So my action plan, um, I wanted to focus on active learning. So once again, some hands-on um, students actually engaging and uh, applying critical thinking skills directly to, um, to their learning. Um, research shows that that increases retention, um, can also help foster real world problem solving, and then once again our relevancy, just making, giving them context for which they can apply that understanding. So for my plan was to have students engage in active learning activities as they learn about and apply technologies in the field of artificial intelligence. This hands-on experience will help students better understand the future implications of and consider a potential career in this emerging field. 
So um, with my innovation grant, I purchased some voice AI kits through Google, um, Vision AI kits the same way, um, and which we'll get more into here in a minute. They're sold as do-it-yourself kits, and they've got step-by-step -step directions. But when you get into kind of personalizing some of those, they're not exactly um, what they were built up to be. Um, Mark Robot, so that's an artificially intelligent autonomous vehicle, and then batteries so that we can um, keep things running. So with this, um, my actual implementation, um, I have a STEM class called Solve for Tomorrow, and it's a real world problem solving class in which students are given the opportunity to develop their own authentic solutions. Um, they will identify the problems and then they develop their authentic solutions. So I did the AI unit with them. Um, we introduced some of the AI technology for that component of it where they had to develop the solutions. And then later on in the year, we did a lesson on um, like a passion project where, in which students were able to select what they wanted to engage with um, and then or what they wanted to learn more about and then do their own research on that one and um, that's where the the autonomous vehicles came in and we'll get more into that in just a moment um, one of the first projects um, was can it be recycled um, for this project students wanted to create a resource that could identify recyclable objects and inform the user where they could go to recycle them. Um, secondarily, students just just having it available, they thought, during lunch um, in the cafeteria would increase awareness, um, kind of give it something that uh, makes it kind of not necessarily taboo, but make it something that um, students typically wouldn't think about, and then therefore increase the chances that they may recycle it. Over here is an image in the bottom right of the vision kit identifying a water bottle and then up here is messing around on the Raspberry Pi side of things because this was powered by a Raspberry Pi that is built within it but in just a moment I'll kind of go more in depth with um, some of the issues we ran into with that and actually this group that utilized this um, they had a much larger project that included other facets as well but they were Kentucky state champs for community problem solving, which was pretty neat. Um, at Home AI Assistant, um, I was going to take the time to kind of walk you through that one, but this group was Solve for Tomorrow, um, Samsung Solve for Tomorrow, Kentucky State Champions. They actually won our school $6,500 with their project, and they'll present this at STLP as well. We'll see how they do, but here's the video that they composed for the project. Alzheimer's is a brutal affliction that decimates numerous I feel like the video does a much better job describing it than I would have. numerous lives each year. Author Jeff Kluger summarized it best when he remarked that suffering is always hard to quantify, especially when the pain is caused by as cruel a disease as Alzheimer's. Most illnesses attack the body. Alzheimer's destroys the mind and, in the process, annihilates the very self. As the disease progresses, those that suffer require more and more assistance just so they can continue living their day-to-day -day lives. People with Alzheimer's struggle with a lot of daily tasks that just seem easy to us and like, like how can we forget that, but they have a really hard time with it. This often requires intense supervision by loved ones or removal from the home and placement in an assisted living facility. However, studies have shown that placement in these facilities has been associated with accelerating the rate of cognitive de decline and disease progression. As the disease reaches the later stages, life expectancy shortens. Therefore, the goal of our project is to help keep them in their homes as long as possible and to help alleviate some of the burdens placed on their loved ones. People in my family have Alzheimer's and I know how tough it is to keep them, like help them remember and not let them forget everything. And when they do forget, it's like hard to keep them on track to what they need to do during a day. Because like when their family, when they have to be looked after by your family, but your family has to go to work, then it's kind of tough on them because they don't know what to do. My great-grandmother has Alzheimer's, and she was lucky enough to have her sister with her her whole life, like once she got it. 
but I know that some people aren't that lucky and they'll need a device like this. So our project is we're trying to help people with Alzheimer's disease stay in the homes longer. Our project is about helping people with Alzheimer's, like helping their families get over the fear of them wandering off, forgetting to do something. Our device has a built-in touchscreen powered by a Raspberry Pi that will provide them with important information and reminders. Additionally, as the disease progresses, those that suffer can begin to forget people that they know. Our device uses voice recognition to help identify loved ones and helps them know who they can trust. Our device utilizes a motion-activated camera to notify a designated caregiver when their loved one has left or if someone else has entered their home. We have an, an internal battery that can keep the device operational for hours in the event of a power outage. If this happen, happens, things can be really scary, so we want to make sure it remains operational. Well, I think it's important that everyone deserves the same chance at life of life than everyone else. Especially if you have one of these diseases, that you deserve a chance to live as long as you can and have the best life possible. So with that, I mean, they did have other aspects as well, not just the artificial intelligence, but that was one of the components that they included within their design. So obstacles and updates. Um, so during the project, there were a few obstacles. For example, that vision AI kit I was talking about, um, the getting it to do our own custom things was, was much more complicated than we had anticipated. Um, we got it to where it could identify the objects. Um, you saw the one image where it was identifying a water bottle, but then once it had identified, we, ha we have yet to um, get it to where it could do anything with the information. Um, additionally, the AI car, we have one actually right here. Um, we've got, the students have gotten them built. Um, this one a kid's doing with, a couple kids are doing with their passion project. Um, but they haven't got that far yet. They haven't got it to where it's up and running and operational. They've just begun on that one. So evaluation, uh, my outcomes, my desired outcomes for the project was to see if students display increased levels of engagement with their classroom content, um, students to demonstrate an in-depth understanding of content through the creation of virtual experiences, and then students to demonstrate an increased understanding of content principles. So I feel like that my goals were met pretty well. Um, as far as the content goes, very few knew. It was, it was a fairly basic quiz, but um, only 32% had achieved what um, had been set out as a passing score on a quiz pre-instruction, and then post-instruction that jumped up to 76%, which is pretty good, but um, probably would have expected that to be a little higher. Um, beforehand, 20% said that they'd indicated they'd be interesting in learning more about AI, but then once they were able to actually get into it, get hands-on, and play with it a little bit more, that number jumped up to 80% of um, that particular group of students, which was extremely encouraging, especially because a lot of those students are actually seventh graders and will have the opportunity to expand upon that um, next year with them. So observations, as I mentioned earlier, um, in the past, I taught a unit about artificial intelligence, but with that one, it was exclusively based on videos and online resources. There weren't any hands-on components. So students were engaged with some of those activities, but it was um, surface level engagement. Um, and they still, at the end of it, didn't really find it interesting. Um, however, this year, it, the hands-on project side of things and then the funding we were able to get with this innovation grant really made the difference, increased student interest um, dramatically, and then um, even the ones that did not necessarily pursue completing an AI build, they were, they all had to come up with a concept, all of them didn't necessarily have to build it, um, but they were extremely interested in the ones um, that their peers presented. In conclusion, so without the materials purchased um, as part of this grant, I would not have been able to engage students to the level that I did. A um, uh, huge thank you goes out to KVEC um, and then their, their offering of this innovation grant. Um, it's really helped our program grow over the last several years and this year included. 
Um, students' comprehension increased in conjunction with their engagement. And then moving forward, I do plan to continue to use this um, unit and these materials in the future. So thank you for listening. Once again, thank you to KVEC for um, providing us with this grant. If you have any questions, here is my email. Feel free to reach out to me, and I'll do my best to answer them. Thank you. Hope you all have a great day. So this is my project called Authentic Applications of 3D Printing. Um, hello, my name is Mark Harmon, and I am a STEM instructor at Ashland Middle School um, in Ashland, Kentucky. And one of the classes that I teach is on 3D printing. So with that, um, my goals of this project, my area of focus, was to improve student engagement, authenticity of projects, and relevancy to students. Um, so we've had 3D printers for a while now, but the problem is um, once you've kind of seen a 3D printer, some students become disinterested with just the basic stuff. Um, other students are still fascinated by it, but then you've got to have several printers to be able to keep up with student interest. Um, so we've got the printer side down. Now this year we wanted to focus more on that engagement to keeping some of those students who've seen the printer and they've kind of moved on to, to re-engage them and keep them interested in it. Um, we did that by improving um, authenticity of our projects. So this allows students to um, make a personal connection because without that, if there's no real world application there, it can decrease student interest. Um, decrease engagement, and if the content's not relevant, if it's not an up-to-date technology um, or application of a technology, then once again it's going to lead to decreased engagement um, or student interest. So therefore my, my research question for this one was, will authentic problem-based learning increase student engagement and improve student achievement? So my action plan um, was first based on my research. Research talked about active learning, keeping students um, engaged. That increases their engagement, increases their critical thinking, increases their retention, sparks creative thinking, and fosters real world problem solving. These last couple ones are really um, are important that we wanted to focus on. Get those creative um, creative gears turning so that way students can truly kind of understand what it would be like to be an engineer um, and then once again we wanted to keep it relevant expose students to potential careers and then show future contexts and applications of their learning to do this to achieve this goal um, students engaged with the implementation of their learning typically students learn 3d modeling by following tutorials completing step-by-step -step instructions. This year we allowed students to engage in the authentic application and implementation of their learning by developing real-world solutions. It allowed the learning to be meaningful, relevant, and engaging. Now when you see some of these in just a moment, um, it'll be kind of interesting um, on what they deemed as a problem. So we did have a 3D scanner so that way we could um, bring in 3D models. We've had some issues with that over the years. A lot of students have wanted to create, take something and then modify it, but then to replicate the entire object would be extremely time consuming. Um, additionally, we have a lot of regular traditional, car, uh, traditional filament. Um, we were able to get some carbon fiber filament, which is much more durable. Um, we actually have a group currently working on our clocks um, in the hallway are the the holders are breaking and you can't replace them so we have a group working on replicating those and that'll be printed out of carbon fiber which will be um, really useful and something that you know will have everyday actual applicability to our school and then toolkits to then adjust and fix um, prints as needed so here are some examples um, this example here there were students that talked about their lockers getting jammed continuously, um, so they developed this item. It's got 
uh, magnets on this side here that it connects in there so that the the mechanism that gets hung whenever you lift it up their binder gets hooked on it so this shields that mechanism from being able to be hooked um, they put that in there to kind of like I said keep that from getting hooked um, up here this one she had talked about her mother um, was pregnant and had trouble getting her shoes on so she wanted to develop something to help her slide it in I didn't want to break her heart and tell her these already existed. These are This is her design. She was very, very engaged and excited. Down here we had a group that um, worked on developing an uh, in-home assistant for individuals with Alzheimer's. They actually ended up doing some modifications to this design and reprinted it in gray. But here is their orange design. This one is actually um, one of my favorite ones. This one is a ice cream holder so the cone goes inside and then as you eat the ice cream if it melts it keeps the ice cream from getting on your hand um, once again this is probably something that does already exist as well but I liked the, the ingenuity there and then the last one here um, I'm just going to let them explain that one themselves this is the Pringles can the Pringles can problem is that you cannot fit your hand into the bottom of the Pringles can to get the last bit of Pringles out of the can so we made this attachment that goes in the bottom of your can and it moves your Pringles up so that you can reach them. And we made this base to create airtight seal so that the chips do not go bad. And now I'm going to demonstrate how the pusher works first. So and at this point they've already removed the bottom as you can kind of, you'll see here in just a second, but once you remove the bottom it doesn't go back so that's what that seal's there for. You take your average pencil and you put it in the bottom and the little knob there and then you take your Pringle scan. As you can see, you stick this in the bottom of your Pringle scan, and then you take the pencil, as I said, and put it in the knob, and then you push it. Therefore, you can get the last of your Pringles pushed to the top. That way you can reach the Pringles. And then you take the base. To stop the Pringles from going bad, we had to make a base so that created an airtight seal so that your chips did not go stale. So you slide this base on, just like so just like that and that creates the airtight seal as Roger said that way your chips don't go bad and that is how the Pringle scan works which that same group spent probably a week week and a half disassembling um, deodorant containers attempting to build their own like screw mechanism to push that up on its own and then eventually settled on the push pop style um, because you know, we, we talk about if the solution isn't working, then find some way to make it work, and that's the way they found to make it work. So for this project, uh, my outcomes, my goals, were for students to display increased levels of engagement with the classroom content. Um, I wanted students to demonstrate an in-depth understanding of content through the application of 3D modeling and printing, and then also key content principles. Um, so as you can see, they applied their learning and they, they, they met my goals there. Um, before um, we did it, early on in the class, I surveyed students and 56% indicated that they were, uh, well, they were unable to identify a practical use for 3D modeling. Um, most of their stuff was just printing, um, printing trinkets, um, things that they found interesting. But then by the end of it, um, all the students were able to actually identify and demonstrate a practical use of 3D modeling. Um, all of them actually created their own objects in the 3D, and then we printed them out and they tested them. Um, one student, he had a drone that he wanted to, he actually brought his drone in and incorporated his design. It was a hook, and the hook attached to the bottom of the drone so he could transport objects to people in need. I mean, it really was a, a great project, um, but once again, wouldn't have been wouldn't have been possible without the assistance of KVEC and the Innovation Grant Program. Um, so, observations in the past, I have taught this 3D modeling class, um, and then for you know for several years, typically they're interested in learning it, but as I said earlier, they're not really at a certain point they're no longer as engaged as they have been. It's oh, okay, I'm remaking something that somebody else has already made but by giving them that opportunity to build what they wanted and to identify personally relevant problems, they were far more engaged 
and it led to increased interest. It also at, um, went to increased ability across the board. Um, we always have students who really take off with it really well and it becomes easy to them, but there were a lot more of those students this time. They, I think it's the, the personal interest in what they were making um, really made a difference. And then moving forward, this is something that I definitely plan to continue with my students in future years, utilizing the technology, the same technologies um, that were purchased with the innovation funding. And hopefully we are able to incorporate the um, scanning aspect even more so moving forward. Um, so in conclusion, this has completely changed the way I teach my 3D modeling class. Um, inevitably in every class, and I'm sure every teacher's heard it, somebody asks, when will I ever need to know this? So this project helped answer that question. Um, students are now taking everyday problems, developing solutions, and then demonstrating that understanding in ways that we could not have previously. Um, so as I said, this will continue in the future as well. So thank you for listening to me. A huge shout out, a huge thank you to um, KVEC and the Innovation Grant Program. Um, this wouldn't have been possible otherwise. Um, if you have any questions or comments or you just want to get a hold of me, here is my email. Um, thank you once again for listening. Well, good evening. Uh, here at Floyd County School of Innovation, uh, we were blessed to have the opportunity to work with KVEC and have some money appropriated to build a work table. And in that, a uh, bunch of our boys, as they began that, uh, we, we went over several different things, inspiration and purpose and uh, where the money's going and all that. But in that, the boys had the opportunity to look at the different, uh, did some research looking at different tables how they were configured, how they were put together in all kinds of different ways so they could try to come to a general consensus uh, as that would be uh, with it. And in that they actually uh, did a reasonable job with this. And we appreciate the opportunity. So uh, in our core curriculum, it is construction, uh, OSHA safety uh, related all the way. So in that, they were given the opportunity to use all the tools that we have here at the facility and uh, began cutting up this wood that was purchased, uh, the two before tops and, uh, and uh, the bottom plate before we could use the, the second shelf. In that they had decided to go ahead and uh, build a miter saw, uh, the swing down miter saw in the midst of it to begin to use it even more. Uh, and then that we began using uh, the wet dry vac, uh, which caught most of our dust here, there, and everywhere else because we were working in a confined space in our school classroom, in which we're working in. So that began catching to that, and we were able to clean the area up and have a little bit better working environment for all of them. And, uh, I had three different groups in one class and the other classes, I broke, broke them up in different groups. Uh, designated lead persons, crew leaders, uh, so that they had designated uh, jobs and performances to do that day. I would assign each of them what needed to be done. And in that they correlated together and uh, began working on the process. I worked through uh, with each of them as they were trying to get their measurements and trying to understand how it was designed and uh, how we were going to put it all together and how it, each individual group, when it was all done, it would end it, it would uh, essentially make this table. So they got several different uh, fundamental principles by working together, uh, working with all the tools that we have, and then assembling it and seeing how the others had put theirs together seeing how each project as it came together, such as on a construction job and everyone doing their individual projects, uh, they were getting a little bit of real life experience in this. So we were blessed and had the privilege for that. We really thank you. And you can see, as we began with our uh, initial cost for all of that, and we consumed all that in the midst of it. Uh, we used the 10 foot two, two befores. It was easier to just get those and we can make our different cuts in it. You will see in some of our pictures here in a minute. 
Uh, they worked diligently on the cuts. They used the squares and levels, uh, all the power saws and the drills and everything else we had to try to put it all together. And each each group did that. We used the casters for the bottom part of it so that we could move the table in and out, uh, get it away from the front of the classroom and move it down the aisles so that it wouldn't be in the midst of everything. So we could go ahead and use the classroom and the uh, the dry erase board and the big screen so that we could use it. And it was, it's, that has been very, very handy for us to move it in and out of the way and just use, get it out where we need it. And in that, they, they learned how to use the safety features of all of it. Uh, every one of them got used to wearing the safety glasses, uh, earplugs and uh, gloves at, at certain times, but safety glasses are pretty well essential. Uh, how to run the drills properly, how to run the, the the saws properly and correctly. So they were making correct cuts and uh, uh, seeing uh, some of their mess ups on some of it when they would make a measurement. And we would put it in and I said, ah, a little bit short this way or that way. I said, you may ought to try that again. So, you know, it's trial and error and as it is and with every job, and those pieces that didn't fit, we used them in other places for, for a framework and so forth. So they did real well with it. Uh, it was a blessing. Here you can see we have a pictorial somewhat on it. You can see towards the middle where we have the two before it's laying on those tables. Uh, we we kind of give those tables a hard life. Uh, those were our regular desks. And then that as they worked to get all that together and then you can see we built the structure so that the, the miter saw as it swung in and out, it would stay sturdy enough. You can see we have just a smidgen of some of the boys. We have five of them here from our early morning class standing at the uh, showing you the the done uh, the finished project, you know, and you see them putting legs on it and so forth. So you know they got a little bit of an idea of what, why we needed it structurally, uh, what length, and put it in there, and our bottom shelf, uh, how to build the structure uh, for our miter saw, and then have the support for it, and have all of that. So they got quite a bit of experience through this. And it was trial and error in certain certain occasions. I would give them the room to go ahead and do it. I didn't stand over them and insist on this, that, and everything else. I watched their safety. And I watched how they were going about it, but they did fine. They did great. They did all right for a, a bunch that had done this. And they had built birdhouses at the beginning of the year, and they were like, hmm. But thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to work with you and through your project and through your program to purchase all this material and allow these young men the opportunity to build this. And my plans are as uh, next year comes along, we're gonna make further improvements to that table. Uh, as, I, uh, as we build it, we didn't think that far ahead. So it's four by eight. So we landlocked ourselves. It can't go outside of this room. So next year, we're gonna cut it down to where we can get it in and out of this room and then build some shelves for all of our other power equipment and so forth. So. This is the beginning uh, and all of these people, the graduates are gonna have them to initial it and put their names and so forth on it so that everyone can see that they had something to do with it. And hopefully this table stays here in this facility for this particular class for a long time. So thank you very much. The men, uh, as you can see their smiles, they were tickled to death to finally get it to a workable condition. So. Appreciate your time, appreciate the opportunity, and you all have a great day. Hi guys, Courtney Kidd here, Floyd County School of Innovation. Um, I'm here to talk to you all about my grant, uh, Amping Up Engagement with Breakout Rooms. Um, this was actually something that I came up with because we were looking for some new ways to incorporate hands-on activities with a lot of our students at our CTE facility. Um, so looking at the inspiration behind this, it was more about getting students involved, getting them to link to material that they may not have necessarily been comfortable talking about in class, but this gave them that opportunity to collaborate with one another. It gave them that little bit of a challenge that they need. Um, you can actually see two of my students there working on one portion of the breakout room that I had designed like a Tarsia puzzle. Um, so having students use a manipulation of 
random and disorderly facts that somehow come together to build one concept or thought that could actually apply in this. Um, I'll talk to you about how I spent the money, the plan of the action, and then things that we've noticed from seeing this grant in action. Um, the grant was used to supply the students with materials that they needed for problem solving situations. Um, we purchased a series of materials to build a class set of nine escape rooms. Majority of our students stay 30 and under population wise during classes. So that gave us enough sometimes to work in partners, maybe a set of three, but usually no more than that. Um, and here you can see the breakdown of the money and how we spent that. Everything from like the Braille al alphabet boards, um, pig pen grids, which are just like the crossing hatches for letters, invisible pens, UV flashlights, all kinds of different padlocks that were custom to make words, letter number combinations. So as they're solving puzzles, they actually had a tangible like treasure box or a unique find that they could use. Um, and then we actually purchased the lockout boxes where the prize or where the reward or where the answer for these escape rooms would be. Um, again, it's not something that was used to replace my teaching, but something to reinforce my teaching. A lot of times, and you'll notice in these pictures, the students are not necessarily using note sheets. They're not using like a series of videos or anything like that, but rather you actually see the incorporation of the content, notes on the desk, videos that they were watching and making. Um, again, another picture from when we did TART, SIA puzzles. It gets them engaged in a playful manner. So they actually can communicate with their peers about the content that we're covering. Um, again, it did allow me to purchase the materials. The cool thing about this, and this is something that I've already latched onto with my coworkers, um, this is something that because we purchased a unique set of items with the ARI grant, um, it makes it readily available for us to differentiate. It's something that I can share with my peers and my coworkers, and it's something that we can engage them in almost every content area with. It just takes a little work on our part to set the codes to make sure the answers fit and that all of their work comes into one final culminating project. Um, here you can see a couple of different images, different puzzles that we've used in the Tarsia. Um, a jigsaw puzzling technique over here. Um, they were using kind of like a flip code letter to alphabet, um, using microscope images like from a micrograph to do some interpretation, uh, visual cues, visual hints, just different things like that. Um, as far as the assessment of learning goes, I do hope this is something that we can continue to use in the classes because I actually did see quite a bit of engagement. Um, and even more so, I saw more student communication. Kids that were not necessarily going to open up and volunteer in class when like I was lecturing or I was covering content, you could actually go around the room and hear them talking to their classmates because it's that little bit of competition that gives them that ambition to want to rise to the top. Um, so it does definitely boost, it's a confidence booster. It makes them more comfortable with the content and it just makes them a little bit more explorative in nature. So they actually are making those connections to what they need to. Um, big takeaways from this for the kids. Okay, well, I mean, yes, I'm satisfied. I get to hear them talk about the content. I get to see if like a formative assessment in a fun way, but big takeaways for this, these can be fun. So it's not that you're taking anything away from the expectations of your students. It's just a different way. Have them compete with each other. Have that little bit of challenge. But even more so, that last statement, learning can be challenging. When I first said we were going to do this, a lot of my students were just kind of like, oh, it's going to be a fun day. And it was. But I don't think that sometimes they associate fun with challenge. Um, and I think that it's okay for them to realize it's all right if I struggle a little bit with content because usually that struggle is what helps them with that learning and with that assessment. So takeaways from this, I mean, it can be fun, but it can push them. They can learn things that they didn't necessarily expect to learn. Um, as far as sustainability goes for this particular grant, I will say this is something, all of the items in this were completely 
recyclable the locks um all of the pig pin pores and the grids everything held up really good through about four of these this year um one thing that i would like to add i would like to make these maybe a little bit more mysterious throw in a clinical aspect for the biology classes make it more of a modern design thing for the engineering but all in all 100 percent on board with this um, we've used several different techniques, several different types of escape rooms. If any of you are interested in finding out some of the things that we've used or what useful websites or where any of the materials for this project came with, you can reach out to me at the School of Innovation. But thank you for your time and I hope you enjoyed that grant. <laughs> Thanks. Hi hey guys, um, Courtney Kidd here from Sleek County School of Innovation. I am here to talk to you about one of my awesome grants this year, Manufacturing Young Engineers. A um, couple of things that I'll talk to you all about, everything from the inspiration for this to where I use the money, what the purpose for the students was, and then I have some awesome pictures for you all to actually see them in action with the funds that we've used. Um, this is probably one of my favorite grants that I have ever done with my students. Um, courtesy of ARI. So I really hope this is something that a lot of you will find beneficial. Um, big thing with this project when we started um, came from the idea and came from the general aspect that working at the CTA school, I am the engineering teacher. Um, just this year, we set our specific pathway for engineering students as an automation pathway. Um, at first, got a lot of kickback from the kids because they were like, well, I really don't know what automation means. Uh, and they're like, only thing I know, mining engineering, civil engineering. And I was like, well, this is like a manufacturing engineering. So having them to look at the process of manufacturing and actually getting them to understand that a lot of the skills that they're learning in these classes are actually making them career ready for a lot of places that our state actually has a lot of factories, a lot of industries, GIF, the Big A fans, Toyota, just a ton of different options that this is gonna open them up to. And just recently with the idea of the state bringing in the new battery company to help us be like an automotive leader for the country, this ties in perfectly. Um, throughout this process, you are gonna see my students working to design, create, and actually test their own custom and personal designs. And I think that was one of the coolest things. It gave them that personal attachment to this project. Um, the idea with the plan of action, I wanted to buy things that I can't normally purchase with regular school funds for my students. I wanted to get my hands on some consumables that would allow them to make and produce products that they normally don't have the opportunity to do. Um, so it was just a really good chance for me to be, get, jump in there and purchase some wood and wax and just different things, leather, acrylic, that they could really put their personal touch or personal spin on. Um, you can see here kind of the gist of where the money went. We did put a lot of money into the actual purchase of an LED like night light lamp project. Um, and I also put a lot of it into doing some cutting boards because initially we had this idea of marketing a lot of these products. We wanted to make sure that these were things that people were going to be drawn to. Um, and then you'll see that some of this has just the regular basic materials on it, like the casts and the laser lights and everything that was used to make and purchase these. Um, and then when we get into the grant in action, you're actually seeing some of my students work here um, some acrylic keychains that they designed, did their text on, and they actually used our school's glow forges to print. Um, an example of one of their personal night light designs, again, it was an LED base. And then this is just the engravable print that one of my students, he actually took it upon himself after I taught them the skill for the conversion to actually hand sketch a piece of art himself. But he took it on himself to actually learn and frame and read about the Glowforge to actually take his own artwork and turn it into his nightlight, which I thought was really cool. Um, here you can see some images of the students using the Glowforge to work on some leather. Um, again, the images, all of them looking or were waiting on their laser prints. 
but we did everything from some laser bracelets over here, the Nemo theme. Um, this one was the student's initials and baseball number. I had a religious quote on a few of them. We had a few make their moms and Mother's Day gifts, which really gave them that little additional attachment to what they were doing. It's like they really took ownership of it. Um, and then on this next slide, this was their final project that I used within this grant. Um, all of them were required to do some sort of decorative art. It had to be 3D in nature. Um, so it had to be a layering effect. They had to have multiple aspects of design with the 2D print or the laser engraving. And all of these are student made projects. Um, this little guy, you have to know the personality. He loved that he got to take a jab at his mom's cooking on a cutting board. Um, I think he was actually taking this home and gifting it. In the middle, I had a young lady who said, well, I have two ideas, can I do both? Um, she did like her own Connect Four game. She did the staining uh, to do the different pieces. She did the laser engraving on the faces. And then she also made like a religious sign again, doing the He is Risen. She did her laser cut and engrave on the back. Um, and then she used acrylic paint to paint her Baltic birch wood. And then she did like a cutout onset on top of that to give that message of he has risen. Um, the top picture up here had a student create a wall hanging for her grandmother. Um, this was basically her family tree and she turned that into something that she could gift her this weekend. Um, so that was pretty cool. And then I had a student turn a camper into a birdhouse slash bird feeder. So you can see the decorative work. And again, this one was painted with the same acrylic paint that was used over here. And all of the boards and the Connect Four game, those were just used with like plain stains or polyurethane, depending on what tint they wanted. But I feel like this grant allowed my students to take a skill that I was teaching them. Um, we did use Inkscape for our conversion tool, but just learning the skills of laser printing, but taking it and making it their own. Um, and just some others off the top of my head that didn't make it. I had a student who just did like a series of earrings. And when I say a series, I was pretty adamant to them about the amount of wood that they had to incorporate in their project. So, I mean, she designed like 13 pair. So it's not just that little bit of, well, can I take this? Can I copy this? Which is, I think a lot of times what people think these laser printing jobs are, I think they just think, maybe they steal and pull those pictures from online. And that's not the case. Um, everything you see here, granted downloading the fonts and maybe pulling some ideas from online, all of these were individual files made by the students. So they were actually making their own marketable project. Um, and what's cool for this, as far as assessment for learning goes, they knocked it out of the park because not only did they talk about the laser printing and you know the products that they made, but it allowed me to open doors as the teacher to things like the ethical issues, making sure that you know there's no bad decision in design that could cause an ethical stir. Are there marketing strategies like that we could actually use to sell your product, making sure you don't break copyright because you can't sell something that someone else has already made. Um, talking about profit margins, you know, is that actually something that you would benefit from making and selling? And from that, I kind of have a, a sustainability and next step slide. Um, this grant has, I mean, it soared for my students. Um, one thing that I think they were kind of disappointed about, we started this semester with the idea of attempting to open our on school store, like online, to sell some of these personal items. Um, we didn't quite make it there, all right? But I want you to realize they have mastered the techniques now. So in full hindsight, I kind of wish I had been able to start this project sooner um, especially with my younger students, like my freshmen and sophomores, like earlier in the year, um, because we're on block schedule, that did kind of give me a jump from some of my younger students to my older ones this second semester. Um, but this is definitely something I think that they could have handled and it's something that I could have merged earlier in the year to get that store off the ground. So, I mean, next steps, 
flat out clearly defined. They have told me this is one of the things that they want to do to help fund our TSA projects next year. Um, as a fundraiser, they want to sell personalized items. So hopefully, and maybe with the assistance of another ARI grant, um, we are looking at promoting and opening the FCSI engineering and design store next year. Um, but again, crazy successful, it, probably one of my favorites that I've done, probably one of their favorites. And I think that's why that attachment is so near and dear to me. Um, but I mean, I have already, I mean, just off the top of my head, I mean, I'm sitting here and I laugh about it, but I have students who are already asking me if they can use the glow forges and the laser printing to do projects for other classes. That was like an STLP project that one of our young ladies is completing. So, I mean, just again, highly successful. And this is something that the students have enjoyed. So if you have questions, if you're curious about, you know, the way that I got them started and the way we jumped into this, please reach out. If you're interested in somehow linking or becoming a part of our store opening next year, please reach out. Um, I appreciate you all. And I thank you for taking the time to listen to me talk about my students' work. Um, and again, I hope you saw something that maybe will benefit your classes, but that would be all I have. Thank you all. Have a good day. Hi guys, Courtney Kidd here from Floyd County School of Innovation, and I'm here to actually talk about my fourth grant, um, Out of the Box Engineering. Um, the big thing with this grant, this one was a little unique than some of the ARI grants that I've done in the past and the others that I did this year. Um, this one started out with a very, very specific purpose, and that purpose was to purchase some of this, okay? Um, my students actually participate in a class that is called Computer Integrated Manufacturing, where they learn how to use a CNC or mill machine. Um, we have been blessed to have a bench mill here at our school, um, but a lot of times our problem is getting our hands on the consumable materials. Um, this ARI grant was kind of geared by that purpose. Um, the Ren Wood that I was just showing you all and talking about, this is actually something that I learned about at a Project Lead the Way training. Um, and they talked about this material being something that would benefit the students as they're learning to do basically some cheaper productions on the CNC machine to actually learn the skills. Um, and I actually took the inspiration from a project that I completed during my summer training where every student was asked to complete like a card box or a trinket box or a jewelry box, whatever you want it to be, regardless it was an enclosure. Um, what you're seeing there on the right are actually like the pre-designed cutouts. Um, these are ones that the Project Lead the Way curriculum will take the students through first to teach them how to do the G-code for the machining. Um, so the purpose was kind of specific and you'll notice the description for the materials that we purchased um, is actually pretty slim, but the reason for that is the REN modeling board that I wanted to use for the students. Um, Project Lead the Way is the sole source that my school can use to purchase that particular material. So $870 of the thousand, I used that geared for the purpose of I wanted my students to be able to create their own containers. Um, the other devices that are listed there, the drill press vise and the end mills, those are actually the pieces that go with the bench mill to do the engraving and cutting on the wood that we purchased. Um, plan of action, again, I use this for my manufacturing class. Um, students would be learning to do the GNM code, the 3D modeling. They'll use the program Inventor to actually run their code. They'll use a CAM program and then we'll work our way up to like the manual machine operations. Um, what you see here is kind of the lead up or the building for that. Basically starting students there on the far left, 
with making initial blocks, which some of my students are still working on right now. We're kind of in the midst of this as I am actually preparing this for you all. Um, but having them design initial blocks using just straight letters, um, because again, we're gonna do this as a hand-based function where they're looking at how do you actually code um, the coordinates for G-code to actually get the drill or the press to read those. So you can see a couple of the designs there, the letter M, the MB for the first and last names. Um, then the students go to a coordinate chart. Coordinates a little different um, than what a lot of them are used to because most of them just talk about the traditional XY planes. When running G-code, we do have to work with the XYZ plane, but also just recognizing that the measurements and the way that things are read are a little bit different than traditional things that they would learn like in a geometry course. Um, and then looking at an actual screenshot of one of the students' g and code plans. This is one where they're actually typing out their code themselves, teaching them how to write the pseudo code in the green. So it's like they understand, you know, what type of code a T1 code is going to tell them to load a specific tool. Um, the S3000, that S referring to the spindle, is going to tell me how many rotations per minute my end presses or my drills are going. So it actually teaches them to match that code to the function that that code is carrying out. Um, and we are also using a program, thanks to this grant, called CNC Motion. Um, this is a program that we use through Intellitech. Um, but this is actually a block that I used in demonstration in showing the students. Um, we've not prepped any of our blocks yet. That's actually occurring next week in here. <laughs> um, but this is one that I prepped of my own initials to show them kind of like that flow. Can the code that they're writing actually make their initials? Um, the benefit to this CNC motion is instead of having them waste and run through these blocks, they actually get to see their code in action, like the drill press the bench mill coming in and doing their engraving based on their code prior to actually popping it in the machine. So it does give them that digital comparison to see if what they're coding actually works. Um, assessment of learning for this grant, honestly, um, so far so good, but I will say this one has been a bit slower than I anticipated. Um, and I don't necessarily think it's because the kids aren't grasping what's going on or anything like that. I think it's just we've hit that spring lull, and I know some of you know exactly what I'm talking about, where students are being pulled for trips, they're being pulled for different activities, different presentations, different things that they're involved in, just in testing even. It just feels like we're in that awkward spot right now. So we are about two to three weeks behind where I would like to be on this content. And in all honesty, I am okay with that. Um, our goal by the end of the year is through this SIM class, those of you that saw my other presentation where the students were doing the manufacturing with the laser engravers, our culminating project is ideally going to be the students using the CNC bench mill to design a large product that they can then personalize on the laser cutters. So even though we're not as far in this activity as I'd hoped by the time I had to present this to you all, I am confident in saying that it is something we are fully going to be able to finish by the end of the semester. So the students will be able to complete every aspect that I had hoped, the design, the coordinate planning, the coding, and the actual prints. Um, Again, this project, a couple of different aspects that kind of intrigued me. Obviously, I mean, yes, I was linked to the engineering aspect of it, but I really like the autonomy and the choice that these engineering projects are allowing my students to have. Um, and not really to surprise, but it's so much more fun and it's so much more endearing, even to me as a teacher, to see my boys latch on because, hey, they're making something that represents them. Some of them have done baseball artwork. Some of them have already asked me, hey, can we do bats if we can figure out a way to slice that and make it fit in these machines? They like that personal ownership. And that's something that these grants have been able to help me just amazingly fund this year. 
Um, if you are curious about the Container Box Project, Project Lead the Way, the bench mill that we have, um, the CNC motion, please reach out. Um, I am an open book when it comes to sharing any tools that I have for my students. And again, especially something that's been so successful so far, it's definitely something that I am hoping that some of you find interesting and may even use in your classes. Um, I do want to thank you for your time. And again, reach out. I'm at the School of Innovation. If you all have any questions, thanks. Hi guys, Courtney Kidd here from the Floyd County School of Innovation. And I'm here to talk to you all about my ARI grant and the completion that we did for Why It Matters, a look into real life biology. So real quick, just kind of the general idea of what I'm gonna be talking to you all about today. This is the basic idea and the premise for the start to finish for this project. This was something that we were able to see from complete utilization um, with the exception of a couple of items that we had purchased that are still back ordered, but a ton of grant and action work to talk to you all about. This is one I'm actually pretty excited about. Um, the, oh, I'm sorry, the big idea behind this grant was to actually get us the funding so we could enhance some of our regular courses. Um, being a CTE school, a lot of times we only think that people are focusing on those career and technical pathway courses. But one big point of emphasis for us is, aside from looking at just the career prep, we're also prepping students for their regular graduation requirements. We're prepping students for college if need be. It gives them that exploratory time. So one intentional thing that we are doing with content here at the School of Innovation is we're working to build confidence in areas so students can make connections between material that's gonna better suit them when they go into like future classrooms or future jobs. So with this, um, what I used the grant funding for was to actually purchase quite a few lab sets where we were looking at like live organisms, like you'll see on there, it says studying the heart rate of Daphnia. Um, coroner's reports, activities where biology students could do like urine and blood analysis. Um, the unknown substance labs are the ones that I was making reference to of still being on back order. Full intention to use those, um, but the company we used, Flynn, those are just out of stock right now. They're telling me that I can expect them in the next month. Um, and also some forensic aspects like ink inspection, fiber inspection, things that I could actually collaborate and team up with our healthcare and our law enforcement teachers and actually give those students that accessibility to talk about, you know, well, why does biology matter? Why does understanding health matter? It gives them that ability to see the real life attachment. Um, throughout the activities with this, we were looking more, uh, more at a um, direct connection with the students with the material um, for them to make those connections to see why things are important rather than just sitting, sitting in. Okay, we've heard that phrase a million times. We don't want the kids to sit and get anymore. We want them to actually engage with the content. We want them to work with the content. We want them to branch out and realize what opportunities are actually available. So many times I've heard those random comments from students about, well, the only thing that I can do is go into healthcare or education. There's really nothing else around here having a school and having classes that focus on career exploration for these kids can open a ton of doors. And by opening these doors to forensic science and opening these doors to different aspects of like medical and biomedical engineering, that's what this grant actually appeals to, is that emotional reach and that attachment to what is possible. A um, couple of things that you see in these pictures, this was a series of anatomy students that I did this with first. Um, we did kind of like a CSI activity throughout using some of these resources. So instead of just all right, learning anatomy planes and then actually learning and reciting words for different types of bones, it was more of an application process to where they were looking at anatomical directions for injuries that a person may have from an autopsy. That's actually the one you see in those two left pictures. 
and then on the right, discovering bones from a crime scene. How do we use those insights? It's not just an important attachment to learn the name of something, but how is it actually something applicable that's gonna carry forward in life? Um, another portion that we use some of the grant monies for in this, we did look and talk about like bacterial and viral infections. Um, you can actually see a picture there in the middle of me talking to the students about plating bacteria and how to isolate colonies. Um, and we made that connection to the material in this left picture with talking about glow germ, like on their hands, like proper hand wet washing techniques, what happens when doctors don't scrub in properly. Um, and we actually use those in conjunction with an activity, a pumpkinectomy. Um, I partnered with our agri agriculture teacher and our healthcare teacher. And we took this activity from start to finish, kind of like from a surgical perspective, all the way through the possible infections and then the agricultural purposes that could have led to having those infections. And you can see one of the young ladies here using the microscope when we were doing the pathology part of this. Um, another portion of this grant, we did want to get their hands on some real life like sampling and the analysis kits. So we did some blood dropping, blood typing. Um, we also did some analysis for different chemicals, looking from sugar testing to protein testing, um, some soil sampling, but you can actually see them engaged not only in an individual setting, but in different aspects of classes, some in biology, some in an after school program, some in an AP class. So you actually see that that was partaking and it was cross curricular and reaching across our school. Um, assessment with this, again, the big thing for me um, that I take away from it, there is a lot of collaboration to give them that real life aspect, but the biggest thing is sustainability, okay? I understand that a lot of these materials are consumables, but at the same time, I realize that a lot of them aren't. Um, there are a ton of materials that we've actually been able to replenish um, just purchase refill kits for and those are things that we're going to be able to use in like future years I mean like legitimately the analysis kits that we purchased with the way that our population in certain classes runs these are things that we could do four possibly five times and then again recycle certain portions off to reuse um, my big takeaway from this one instead of using just direct setup I would like for future lessons to become more scenario based. Like I mentioned the pumpkin egg to me that I did with my two collaborating teachers. Um, I would like for all of this to be become more case study, more medical mystery, more, more like unsolved cases. So the kids actually have to delve into the material. There's a lot of manipulation of thought. So initially by thinking about these and just saying it's real life science, um, I do want to put that little bit of a twist on it. So it is more of a problem solving task for them. Um, any questions about this grant, uh, feel free guys, reach out to me, email me, contact me in some way. I would be happy to talk to you about some of the kits that we purchased. Um, I do have some favorites. I do have some that I would probably bump off the list just after seeing the way the kids interacted with them. Some were more interesting. Um, but I would love to discuss those things if anyone is curious and looking into more real life applicable scenarios to use in classes. Uh, thank you for your time and I hope you enjoyed the grant. Thank you. Hello, I'm Sarah Kincaid and I'm with Belfry High School in Pike County and I want to talk to you about virtual is now reality. Um, the project I have completed uh, dealt with getting my students out of the classroom. And um, you know, we live in the land of the time of COVID. And um, restrictions, you know, have just recently been lifted on so many other things. And then even without the restrictions of COVID, we live in a time of small budgets. And so taking a big trip, is, is not an option. I had a trip planned several years ago. I was hoping to have a trip planned, and then when I went to um, to get all the details for it, I was so excited. I got it approved, and then the cost of travel was just through the roof. We were going. I was going to take a class of the students to Grandfather Mountain in Linville, North Carolina, and they had this um, 
the teaching thing, this, this um, education resources and all this stuff. And they had a teaching lab and it was just going to be this amazing place. And you know, by the way, if you've never been to Grandfather Mountain, I would highly suggest that you go. Anyway, um, that just says that it's not feasible. Finances are not, do not make it feasible at times. And so that's why I thought we have too much technology to, it's not the same, you know, because I think travel is one of the greatest things that you can give yourself. Um, and so virtual travel is not the same, but it can be a, a fairly decent knockoff version, I guess. And so that's what we're going to be looking at today. So virtual is now reality. We live in the virtual world. Uh, we taught school for the last two years or last parts of now three school years on some level of virtual at some point or another. And so I thought, well, let's make this virtual better. So what I looked into doing was um, I saw that my problems were, as we, I mentioned in the fall, some, I had a student tell me in, in August that he had never left the state. And now where I'm located in um, eastern Kentucky, um, our school, like I'm sitting in my classroom right now videoing this, and our school is about a mile and a half from West Virginia. And this is a high school student who said, I've never been to West Virginia. I know that's just baffled. I said, have you ever been to West Virginia? I mean, I started pointing. I was like, it's across that bridge, you know, like right down the road here. And he's like, yeah, I've never been there. I was like, and the whole class was just like, you been to West Virginia? You've never been to Williamson? And I said, why not? He said, well, I've never had a need to go there. And then it dawned on me. I'm like, this is a student who probably does not have the resources that I had first thought he would have. And he had his answer was so correct. He's never had a need to go there. And so I'm like, okay, we we got to fix this. And so when I saw had the set when he said that and that you know he'd never traveled outside the state, I'm like, okay, we need to do things that's going to bring bring stuff into our classroom. So I also talked about funding is an issue, and then we have travel restrictions. So this is how I sought to to correct this, and uh, we ordered some virtual reality goggles that are smartphone adaptable. Now, they, they just arrived um, the other day, and which is great. Um, we, you know, with some supply chain issue stuff, things have been a little delayed this year, but that's okay. Um, but they did arrive, and as soon as they, you know, anytime you get a package, and a student, you know, you get a package delivered to your classroom, the kids are like, oh, there it is. What'd you get? What'd you get? And so we immediately opened up our boxes, and this is what we have. And so as you can see here, we have, we purchased the Homido. I'm sorry, but my bell is ringing in the background give me just a moment okay we bought the homido immersure self and it is very easy to um to work with and we'll show you pictures of that in just a moment what my students had had done and these were about 25 dollars um and i ordered them from a company uh bloom bloom technology um it is out of minnesota but our local um, for Kentucky is our Cincinnati, and they were on the big list uh, for our county, so I'm sure they're all for your county as well. They were about $25, $20 to $25 a piece, and so I ordered a classroom set of those, um, and we they, it was advised that you get an iPad to go with that because there are different things that you can hook them up with. Um, the whole class goes to the same thing, you know, um, Google Expedition, uh, anything of those cardboard activities, um, uh, YouTube 360, so many things that, that you can do. And so I realized that you know, our kids are into this whole digital Oculus world, but then some things are still low tech that really, really impress them. Um, you know, looking, taking trips to places like the Great Wall of China that you can't see, um, the project that we're going to implement here in a few weeks is we're going to experience, um, we're going to go to the Holocaust Museum and we're going to experience aspects of World War II and the Holocaust. Things that they don't need to forget in history, but also that they can't totally experience it because they weren't there. But through picture, through technology, through video, we can see so much more. And that was the goal of this activity, of this project, or this grant was that we would provide them with opportunity to do more, to get outside of the classroom and see more. So we're going to see here, so like the very basics, and the, good, the reason I decided the whole classroom set was not just for me. I have the classroom set, I'm going to keep them, but then 
I'm here on the, the wing of our history department, and so my whole my whole history department will benefit from this when we have different activities that we can uh, sort of schedule our uh, units around. So here's some pictures. The video, for whatever reason, would not upload of my students. And the good thing that I like about these, as you can see here, um, my student here in the middle, this is an updated version. And the instead of having the type that to, that goes totally around your face and then on your head, these are much more sanitary. Uh, they have areas that it's just hard plastic that you can just wipe it off. Uh, but the big thing is you're not having to wrestle about, you know, high school kids, especially girls, you know, they're all perfect or whatever. Uh, but you're not having to wrestle that around. And then you don't have any worries of it dropping. So if you have, if, you know, they're putting their cell phone in it and they're literally putting it on their face. And so it makes it, um, um, they have more control over it. So as you can see here, they um, they are able, able to, we were just looking at 360 videos that day and, um, you know, checking those out and seeing different things. And it was, you know, it's really interesting because if you, if you stand, it creates, um, creates you know some sort of balance issues even though it's you're really not off balance but you're you know because of those 3D uh, type scenarios with the video it makes it a little difficult for you to sort of get your bearings but it was it, it created some acts some some excitement some enthusiasm in my class the day that they arrived and they immediately you know let's open and look into it and that's what I believe is the is the key or the the purpose behind these ARI grants. Is that we are using them in a way to create enthusiasm for our classrooms, to create um, opportunities that our students would not otherwise have. And if on a, a virtual tour of um, of West Virginia, even though West Virginia is just right down the road, they we're going to give them that opportunity. We're going to take them outside the classroom and um, without ever leaving. You know, we're going to take them to this whole different world. And the, the funding, and we're not going to have to ask for funding. We're not going to have to get a travel ticket or anything like that. And, you know, it's simply that to show up with their cell phone. Start your cell phone, you know, tell, tell the kids in advance, hey, everybody needs to have your cell phone tomorrow. Um, we're going to, people are going to do an activity. And that's what I wanted to do with this, with the, um, the VR goggles, to give students an opportunity to see things that they may not otherwise see. So if you have questions about the product or how I'm implementing it, my um, email is there at the beginning of the slide. And I am, again, I am Sarah Kincaid with Belfry High School in Pike County. Thank you for your time. Hello, it's nice to be with you today. I am Sarah Kincaid at Belfry High School, and I am here presenting to you today about my uh, ARI grant that. Um, that I worked on throughout this year. I want to give you some background information about it and then talk about it uh, towards at the end, uh, how things uh, progress throughout the year. Let me set my presentation up. So it says, not a blank canvas. As many of you all had to deal with for the last few years with COVID and virtual and all those things, we had to come up with some new format to present our information. And our county here in Pike County decided to use Canvas uh, these last two school years as a um, as our um, learning management system, as our platform. And so, what I uh, wanted to talk about and what I wanted to use with my Canvas was that I realized that um, it's not that exciting. <laughs> um, sometimes when you have to go large stretches of virtual or um, uh, when um, you have a student who's going to be home for a while or whatever else. And so we wanted to, I wanted to take Canvas and make it better. So it's enhancing Canvas LMS with engaging teaching. Now it says, what makes, a, 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 what makes Crash Course so successful? And so we all know, we've all been in, um, exposed to Crash Course at one time or another, and we have used it. Um, you know, some other things are great. You know, I one John and Hank Green, I give them total thumbs up because they have millions and millions of views, and they they make some very interesting videos. The thing that I saw and that my students complain about the most is that they talk so fast, and they give you so much information in anywhere from 12 to 17 minutes. And even me as a teacher who um, knows the content, <laughs> I'm a little overwhelmed at time as well. And so I thought, how can I take that 
and make some videos for myself that are, you know, take that the entertainment, the energy, the, the creativity of, of, of a crash course, not totally to um, uh, copyright or, you know, to, to cabbage on to what they've done, but to take the, uh, those concepts and put it into my own classrooms. That's what this whole grant is about. Now, um, we wanted to, uh, problems that I recognize is you have um, virtual learning days, you have NTI days, you have blended learning. All of these things became, are no longer something that was foreign to us. They are very much in our, in our class today, in the world in which we, we still live. And so I wanted to take, recognize that that was a problem, but I wanted to make it better for my students and, you know, and it's safe, but better and more efficient for me. And when I'm a better, when I'm a better, more efficient teacher, I am a much more effective teacher. And I, I credit that with lots of things, with new technology making it better. So, as I said in the fall, Canvas is great. I love it. I, if they wanted to like hire me as the person that, that like goes and tries to sell other schools on Canvas, I totally could. Because I see that such advantages to it. I teach, a, I teach high school social studies and it's very organized. I keep my Canvas um, pages very organized. And so, for me, uh, even though, and it was, I will have to say, I was a virtual teacher or a digital teacher prior to um, quarantine. So I had been a digital classroom for two years. I had used um, Google Classroom and I loved it. And uh, then when Canvas came along and we began to, we onboarded it. We didn't get Canvas until right before school started um, last year. So this is our second full year using it. And I was first a little overwhelmed. I thought, oh my gracious, you know, give us Google Classroom. Let's just go back to that. And as highly as I was a fan of Google Classroom Canvas. I, I like it so much better. Uh, but it's just preference. It's just preference what you've gotten used to. So we've gotten used to Canvas and I love it. So we also realized that an issue is that you got to have good AV equipment. And you've got to have, anybody who's watched a YouTube video, you got to have good video. But before video, you can have, you can have okay video, you know, but you have to have good audio. And that is so important. And then I wanted to implement AirDeck. Now, what um, what I wanted to bring down with this, and that's what, that was my plan in the fall when I wrote this. I was going to do all these different things. I had planned on buying this big camera and this lighting system and you know, all these different things. But the theme of all of my videos today, if you watch any of the other ones, is going to be um, colleague collaboration. Colleague collaboration. That's what I think is the heart of ARI. And I really hate that we haven't been able to meet in person for these last few years, even though we continue to have grants and things like that, because I learn way more from my colleagues at Belfry High School and in Pike County and throughout all of KVEC than I do, I could watch a million YouTube videos or I could read 50 articles or whatever else. I learn more from my colleagues and that's what the rest of my conversation is gonna be about today. When I went to order these things and last fall I had this whole big list of this big fancy camera and like I said all this stuff, lighting and a green screen and all this kind of stuff. So I went to our, our, our tech guy here at our high school and I was discussing with him what I was going to do and what I wanted to do and he's like okay you know what are you doing? So blah, 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 you know, I'm just trying to make you know better videos and you know not just constantly be uploading something that someone else has done because I look at other people's PowerPoints and stuff like that that you find online because we all we all do that. And I change them not that they're necessarily bad, but they don't 100% fit with our content or our um, curriculum document. And so I went through this whole big thing, gave him this big list, and he started looking at it and we began discussing it. And he said, why do you need all this stuff? He said, you're going to have to set that up and take that down every day or every day that you do the videos. And I was like, okay, yeah, we got to get in the office and blah, blah, blah. He said, how about you just use an iPad? And I said, an iPad? I said, well, why, would I, why would I do that? Why would I get, you know, I'm like, no, I have looked and found all this cool stuff. And he said, well, unless you're me making like big movies, videos, you know, several minutes, he said, if you're doing this just for, um, for your classroom, he said, if you're looking like that 15 minutes or less, he said, why don't you use an iPad? He, and he gave me all the links, you know, he had all this stuff. He said, get an iPad Pro, get one of their keyboards, and use that. 
he said, he said, you know, I'm moving. He said, you can't really be I'm moving. And he said, that's just the best way to go. And he said, you're going to have a lot of versatility with that. And so I'm like standing there in the hallway. I was like, are you kidding? That's all I need is one item. And so that's, that goes along with my whole concept of colleague collaboration. Because I had done all this research about making YouTube videos and about making school you know, educational videos and blending your classroom, all this stuff. And they were sending me everywhere to buy 50 different items. And I had a colleague who said, hey, you're sort of still new to this. And why don't you just get an iPad and eliminate it? He said, that'll be easier for you. And that's what I think is the true heart of, of um, ARI, is talking with other people. Because I, you know, I'm very confident in my abilities. I'm very confident in my decision making. That doesn't mean I know everything. And here was this guy, you know, Josh Sloan. You all may have seen him before. He's gotten ARI grants in the past, and he had the answer in a matter of seconds because he approaches things from a technology standpoint, where I approach them from this content teaching standpoint. And in a matter of moments, he said, "This is what you need. When I get back to my classroom, I'll send you the link." Blah blah blah. Just watch it. You need this something you do. And when I contacted the technology here in the county, they're like, oh, yeah, sure, that, that'll work, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, oh, my gracious, that is so much better. Because as I said a few moments ago, when I'm a more efficient teacher, I can be a more effective teacher. And because I collaborated through the, the rest of the ARI grants with another colleague, I was able to figure out, I didn't need all that other stuff. He said, yeah, that sounds great and it looks really good on paper, but you don't need all of that. And he said, this way, if you're videoing at home or you're videoing at school or whatever else, you've got it covered. So that is the gist of mine. Now, due to supply chain issues, uh, my iPad Pro and my tablet, my tablet and my keyboard have yet to arrive. Uh, they were ordered back in uh, February, back in the late winter, and they have not arrived yet. So I, you know, hopefully... They will get here before the end of the school year. But I have been realizing what to, you know, using this grant and using the tools that I have found online, I'm um, able to make a much more efficient, uh, efficient presentation and realize that, you know, I, my students do want to see me. And that was something that we, I, uh, during my research, is that your students want to see your face, just like we have to show our face in this presentation. You know, they don't make the connection all the time with John Green, even though he's great, or Khan Academy. That's okay. Those are great great individuals and great resources, but they're in my class. So they want to see my face. So um, as you continue on with your grants and apply next year, remember that efficient makes you effective, and colleague collaboration is, is essential. And it helps you to, it opens your doors up and opens your eyes up to so many more opportunities. So if you have any questions, remember I'm Sarah from Taylor's Belfry High School. My email has been included. And I will happily uh, talk about with you about anything that you have planned uh, with your projects or what you're doing in your class. Thanks so much for listening to me and you have a great day. Hello everyone. It is hard to believe we are here at our spring summit. This year has absolutely flown by for me. Uh, it's been exciting to be back in the classroom after I retired and stayed out a few years uh, and then went back to teaching uh, post-COVID and uh, it's definitely been a challenge for me. There we go. Uh, student safety was the biggest issue that I had going back into the classroom. Uh, the classroom that is new to me, that it's new school, is phenomenal. It has a tremendous amount of storage and the kids were provided with an opportunity to have an individual storage space. They had drawers that I divided in two and put their names on it. You'll see here in a second. You can see the biggest issue though was that students were sharing supplies. You can see in that center photo there. And uh, to sanitize color pencils and some of the personal supplies in between there was impossible. Cleaning the desk and those type of things were easy, but those individual supplies were not. Here are some of the drawers, and you can see how I divided them up so that they can keep their things separate from others and their names on the drawers. Um, with art, art is such 
a phenomenal tool to help kids learn to be creative, to help kids deal with issues, to help them think outside the box, develop problem solving skills. Um, and I think every child, every child should have to have art, uh, whether they feel creative or not, just because of the problem solving it teaches them. With this grant, I paired it with another from the Youth Service Center that I had access to. And I was able to purchase all my students individual sets of watercolors, of paint, paint brushes, drawing pencils with erasers, art journals, color pencils. And they were just super, super excited. They could not believe that they were able to keep all this as their personal stuff. They didn't have to leave it in the class and share it with other students. In this photo, you can see one of my students who is showing me her journal and what she's doing. These are all done outside of class. Um, in the bottom right, you can see she's got some writing on there and a drawing, and the left is a drawing. And she asked me not to read it because it was something personal. I said, that's okay. And that was one of the concerns when they got the journal. Are you gonna be reading all the stuff that we're putting in it? And I'm like, no, not unless you want me to read it. I want you to use it. Don't not be afraid that someone's gonna read what you're putting in there. Um, here's another one, show me your student work. On a photo on the right, kids are sharing information. Uh, occasionally I gave them prompts that, um, the first one that I, one of the bigger ones that I gave them after our mask mandate was lifted. How do you feel about coming to school without masks now? And, uh, I was surprised with some of the mixed answers. I thought most of them, the majority of them be, I'm excited without a mask. I felt masks are stupid, but it was about half and half. Uh, a lot of the students were excited to be without masks. The other ones said, I don't really feel comfortable. I still feel unsafe, like I'm being invaded by stuff. And uh, I still have students to this day who are wearing masks who don't not feel comfortable. The results of, the products that I gave these kids has been interesting. I'm excited about them. Over the course of the year, I have had 320 students. And like I said, my students rotate every nine weeks. And I pulled my classes with these questions. Does having personal supplies make you feel safer when it comes to sharing viruses and germs? And 100% of them said yes. They liked having their own supplies that it some left them in the drawers there at school, others put them in their backpacks so they knew nobody was handling them but them. And they could take them with them to home to use in those journals. Uh, ask them, do you use your supplies outside of art class? 228 out of 320 said yes. Some of them were using them for other classes, but most of them were using them at home. And I even had one who said, uh, my sister took all mine. Do you use your art journal supplies to help relieve stress? Was the next question that I asked them. And 176 out of 320 said yes. A lot of them chose not to answer. Uh, I think it was just a little bit of anxiety of wondering, you know, maybe I'm gonna get too personal and ask them stuff. But it was exciting to see that this was serving the purpose that I got these for. One, keeping them safe. Two, helping them with the stress and we've all got stress and COVID has added on to that in more ways than we care to admit. But the biggest thing that I got excited was about is that these students were excited to have their personal supplies. Uh, I've even had students come back and ask if I had any leftover extras. And I did have some students who are not artsy and didn't use their journals, donate the stuff back and say, here, you can give them to somebody else. Um, so I do feel like this has been a very successful grant, um, an opportunity for these students. And I'd like to thank KVEC uh, for this ARI grant and the opportunity to, to give my students a voice through their art supplies. And thank you again. Library Makerspaces for Engagement and Exploration. My name is Carrie Literal and I am the Library Media Specialist at Ashland Middle School in Ashland, Kentucky. The Action Plan. Our hope was to create a makerspace opportunities in the library as a way to reach all students. 
giving them the chance to explore and create during their library time. We have 697 students within three grade levels. Our library schedule is open, allowing teachers to schedule their classes for any day of the week. The maker stations funded through the KVEC grant included 3D printing station, the 3D pen, the stop motion animation kits with modeling clay as the medium, as well as wood burning pens and a laser engraving machine. The action research. Each student was given a survey before utilizing the maker stations to get an idea of their experience with the tools or mediums. The results we found were shocking. A large majority of our student population had not ever worked with clay, used a 3D pen, designed and created with a 3D printer, used stop motion software. Of the 452 students who have had access to or used our makerspace areas, only 43 students had ever used the 3D printers, and those were used within their STEM electives. Um, 12 students of the demographic had used a 3D print. 3D pen, and only 14 students had worked with modeling clay in an art elective. None of our students had ever worked with or used claymation software. The plan continues. Of the five maker station areas, three have been completely successful. The handheld wood burning pens, the 3D design pen, and the 3D printer. Students have not been able to use the engraving machine as of yet due to needing a ventilation hood system. This is this machine emits smoke and can cause the smoke alarms to activate. We did not anticipate this setback, um, but we have ordered additional components to correct this issue. Students have greatly enjoyed designing creations with the clay. However, they have been hesitant to use the claymation software. With that said, um, it's my belief that they have chosen the other tasks to enjoy um, just due to the short time constraint that they have um, within the library. I'm hopeful that with repeated visits, they'll be more inclined to try this software. And I'm also going to be showing some examples um, of videos to encourage their use with that software. Um, so here are some of our maker spaces in action. So we have um, a couple of our students had designed uh, clay figures with the modeling clay. We have here on the left hand side, that is our clay creation station. Um, in the far back of that picture, we've also designed a game with the modeling clay so that they will be more inclined to use it. They spin that wheel and then they design um, a clay creation with the topic that's highlighted, highlighted on that spinner uh, and they compete against their friends. So we were doing that to encourage um, clay creations and then hopefully they could turn that into a claymation creation with the software. Um, on the right hand side we have a couple of students trying out the wood engraving pens. Over here we have our 3D pen in action. So um, the middle um, picture is a bicycle that was created with the 3D pen. Um, on the right hand side we have one of our students creating a bookmark. These are our creations that were created with the 3D printer. So one of our um, maker space stations is an art bar and we were struggling to get our markers propped up in a way that would be easy for the students to see and grab and so one of our students had the idea of let's print a 3D stand and so they used um, patterns that had already been created but they found this um, octopus stand and they were really excited about creating this so we gave it a whirl with um, and it works amazingly as you can see in those pictures. On the right hand side you see that um, we have been exploring with and trying out different patterns um, of chess pieces so um, the students found a pattern for a 1920s model chess set and they tried that out and it was really successful. Some of our other makerspace uh, pictures, these are um, pictures demonstrating those wood burning tools that you just witnessed in a previous picture. These kids are getting a safety talk from me on the left hand side. Um, we have had some trial and error with that, um, but they've got the safety talk and then they were creating with those pattern stencils and those different um, tips that can be changed out to give you a different look. 
uh, right here, we have our students uh, picking a design that they will then create with the 3D printer. You can't see it in the picture, but they ultimately decided they were going to go with um, a model car of a Lamborghini. So this is their choice process. And that is the end of our presentation. Um, as you can see, our maker spaces um, are definitely enjoyed by our students, and we are so thankful that we got the support of this grant so that we could fund those um, adventures, and we hope to have a lot more in the future. Hi, my name is Jesse Lucas. I'm the physics and engineering teacher at Pikeville High School, and I am presenting uh, my KVEC grant, which was titled BattleBots. Um, so my problem of practice that I was exploring is can creating a project like the construction of a BattleBot be an effective team project that can cross multiple engineering disciplines and garner more interest in each discipline? So the, that's kind of a thick statement, so I want to break it down just a little bit. Um, the one of the bigger parts of this was the effective team project. Um, so as a, a CTE teacher, one of the main things that I try and look to do with my kids is build the skills that employers need um, and what they want. And one of the big needs uh, right now is team players. People just don't know how to work in teams. So creating those team norms now uh, in a project like this and such a, an extensive project like this is really, really important to me. Um, and also the cross uh, multiple engineering disciplines. Um, so a lot of times when kids are thinking about engineering disciplines, uh, they think of them as very you know standoffish. So you got mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, computer science, civil. They don't realize how they kind of entwine uh, all with each other. Uh, so doing a project like this where it's going to take uh, mechanical, electrical, and computer science is really, really important to me. Uh, so the kids can kind of see how they all mesh together and come together. Uh, so with that, what we're really trying to aim to do is to create battle bots, um, and we'll talk about what type of battle bots here shortly, uh, and have a robotics competition and actually have a, a battle bots tournament here at the school. Um, so the implementation, uh, in the beginning, uh, what I decided to do was buy the ant weight bots. Now, what the ant weight bots are, are they just little one pound, and uh, I have one right here, uh, little one pound battle bots um, and uh, there's a couple reasons I decided to go with the one pound bots uh, first was the money uh, they're a little bit cheaper uh, than the other ones and they still get the point across and they're still really fun um, and then another reason why is because uh, the beetle weight which is the three pound they're a little bit less safe these are very safe nobody's gonna hurt themselves um, nobody's going to you know uh, cut off a finger or anything like that. And there's a really safe space that we can practice with them. And it was super simple to put together an arena. So logistically, that just made more sense. Um, now, in the beginning, uh, I was going to do this in my principles of engineering class, my engineering two class. Uh, but I actually opted out of doing it with them. Uh, I actually ended up just doing it with my intro to engineering design, uh, which is my first engineering class. Uh, there's a couple reasons why. One, I feel like my, my first year class is really advanced. So I was afraid, and you can see kind of on the slideshow, uh, I was going to do the more advanced bots, and I'll show you those here in just a second, uh, a, a picture of them. Uh, I was going to do the more advanced bots with POE because I was afraid that the first year class wouldn't be able to do it. Uh, but as the year progressed, I, I have a lot of confidence in the first year, uh, and, it, and it's worked out really, really well. Um, and the plan right now is we just built them and we're just starting the reverse engineering project. And I'll walk you through exactly what that is a little bit later as well. Uh, but it fit into the, the engineering one curriculum so much better uh, and really seamlessly. Uh, so uh, with the resources and the personnel, uh, the resources, so I ended up buying BattleBot kits from two different uh, FingerTech carriers. So FingerTech is the company that you're really looking for. Um, and uh, I bought them from two different places. I bought them from uh, 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 I bought them from the robot shop, 
which you can see right here. And then I bought them from a guy named Brandon Kittenridge, and I'll talk about that here just shortly. Um, so I bought them from two separate locations. One of the reasons why is I just wanted some variation in the actual design of the bots for the kids. Um, and connections I made during the research, I actually made some really, really good connections. Um, so if you've never heard of Newton's Attic, Newton's Attic is a place in Lexington, Kentucky. Um, and they do a lot of STEM stuff uh, with kids. Kids go there on field trips and things like that. And at there, they actually have about 150 pound battle bots. So I actually reached out to them and talked to them. Um, and we're, we're right now talking about the kind of a partnership where they're gonna train some teachers to actually create a battle bot league. And I'll talk about that uh, shortly as well. Um, I also met Brandon Kittenrich. Like I said, I bought some kits off of him. Um, and the really cool thing about him is he actually has a bot that's going to be on the Discovery Channel Battle Bots. Uh, so he's just given me a plethora of knowledge. He's helped me with troubleshooting on the bots. Uh, and he's been a great resource to me um, when I'm trying to work through this. Uh, and I've also talked to KVEC about trying to do some of the other stuff with this as well. Um, so with, the, with uh, that, here are the two bots that I bought from the robot shop. Um, as you can see, one of those is just like the one that I have right here. Uh, this is a flipper bot. It looks like there's a little spatula. The spatula gets up and under another bot, and then boom, tries to flip it up really quickly. Uh, the other ones, uh, those actually have blades. They're a little bit more uh, unsafe, but as long as you follow the safety procedure, they're totally fine. Uh, and the ones that I got from Brandon Kittenrich, like I said, you can look at those and tell those are very different from the first ones. And those are the more advanced ones that I was gonna do in engineering two, but I decided to do with engineering one anyways. Um, those ones are a little more advanced, but like I said, I really wanted those variations because it would work really good uh, for the projects that we're trying to do. Uh, so with the outcomes, uh, what I wanted was, like I said earlier, that cross discipline projects. I really wanted them to see that those engineering disciplines mesh uh, and with the, uh, um, with the teamwork aspect as well. Um, and some of the outcomes that I would like, and this is a little bit more long-term, uh, I'm like I said, I'm doing ant weights right now, so I'm just doing these little one pound bots, uh, but I would like to move up eventually to the beetle weight bots and then potentially to kind of heavier bots, maybe anywhere from 25 to 50 pounds. Uh, and that kind of segues me into the partnership that I've made with um, Newton's Attic. So Newton's Attic right now is plan on, planning on training four different teachers during the summer to try and start a battle bot league, but it's, uh, they're not necessarily going to call it battle bots, but it'll be with the bots that you're, that I'm showing you just anywhere from 25 to 50 pounds. Um, and it'll be almost like battle bots combined with Vex robotics competitions where there's some task that they have to complete, but they're also trying to fight each other. Uh, the way that he explained it to me was it's very, very similar to, um, like squid game. You have one team that's attacking one team that's defending. Um, so it sounds really, really cool to me. Uh, I'm really excited to get that started and going with them. I, we've worked hard kind of throwing ideas on how we wanted to do it uh, and creating a league uh, here in Eastern Kentucky and they're very excited about it as well. Uh, and then one of the other outcomes, especially if we can get a league, uh, is the interest associated with it. I think this is one uh, competition or one project that could really get kids interested in um, the engineering discipline, which is good for Eastern Kentucky uh, all around. Uh, so measuring the outcomes, the pre-assessment, uh, what I've gotten to right now, uh, I asked them some of the pre-assessments like the axles, I asked them the servos, the motors, the different types of wires and sensors inside, uh, and only 28% of the components are known. Uh, I'm going to ask them at the end, but I would be shocked if 100% of those components aren't known in the end because all of these students have been super, super uh, into these projects so far. Uh, so reflections, uh, that's reverse engineering a better bot. Uh, and the bulk of the content actually comes from this. So what happens here is what I've decided to do is these students are gonna, students have already built the battle bots themselves. Um, and they've seen how they function and they see how they work. Uh, and now their goal right now, and they're right in the middle of it right now, is they are reverse engineering ways to improve their bot. So everybody has their kind of blank bot that they start with and they have to design a way to make it better. Then they have to create it on uh, Autodesk Inventor, which is a 3D designing software. And then we're gonna actually 3D print the improvements that they make on their bot. Then we will have the tournament. 
Um, so that's a lot of reflection, a lot of systems thinking. They have to think of how all the systems are gonna work together uh, and how they can make them better, which is what engineering really is, is looking at a product, figuring out how to make it better. Um, so I'm really, I'm really excited to see the end product. They've done so well so far. Uh, it's been by far the most interactive project of the year. They've loved it start to finish. They love it every day. It's been great to work with them. And then soon we're going to have the BattleBot tournament where we've got eight different bots. <clears throat> we'll have a loser bracket and a winner bracket. Um, and it's really easy to directly associate any of the skills that these kids uh, get with this, with this project, because this is really the only project that I've really hammered hard with them uh, all these engineering concepts. Like I said, the pre-assessment, they only knew 28 of components. So hopefully by the end, they'll know them all um, and they'll get a better idea of that systematic thinking, uh, that engineering disciplines all work together. They can work together as a team uh, and they can really reflect on a project, uh, a product that they make and make it better. Um, so uh, thanks for listening and that is my project. Hi, my name is Jesse Lucas. I am the physics and engineering teacher at Pikeville High School and my presentation and my grant was called Newton's Playground. The problem of practice that I was trying to um, figure out is can using wireless simplified sensors increase the efficiency of a lab and therefore lead to more learning and deeper thought about the data. Um, so the way that I run my classroom, especially my physics classes, is very Newtonian. So a lot of times at the beginning of my, my units, I'll do a lab, uh, they'll collect a lot of data, and I have them at least try to find the relationships between the variables that we're gonna be talking about for that uh, unit. Um, so to, to increase the efficiency of those labs, the less time you can work on the procedures, the more time you have to analyze the data that they collect. Um, and then there's applications to testing and real life um, because if they're using the more efficient sensors, um, they're more likely to be able to use that more advanced uh, equipment and technology later on as well. Uh, so what I decided to do was I decided to buy uh, something called Vernier LabQuest 3s. Um, so I already have um, sensors but buying these opens up a new world because they're overwhelmingly more efficient. And we'll talk about how, how much more efficient a little bit later. Um, and I use these pretty regularly uh, in my, my physics classes and I use them some in engineering. Uh, for example, I use them in labs like my forces labs, my momentum lab, and that's the one I'm gonna be discussing a little bit later. Um, if I would've got them at the beginning of the year, I'd use them on the acceleration due to gravity lab. Uh, so it's kind of used everywhere in the class. Um, so before, and this is just an example of uh, Newton's second law lab. So this was a lab to try and get the students to derive the equation F is equal to MA. Force is equal to mass times acceleration. It's a pretty simple lab. Uh, so before I got the sensors, um, I would have to use a spring scale. If you don't know what that is, it's basically a hook attached to a spring. You hang the object on it and it will kind of give you an estimate on what the force is down the ramp. Uh, there's a huge source of error on that because uh, you're using a spring uh, and it's also on a ramp so it can kind of stick. It, a lot of bad data comes from that. Uh, and the photo gates that I use are really old. Uh, you got to click three buttons to collect the data. If you misclick one of those buttons on accident, you mess up the lab and you have to rerun the trial. Um, and it's really, really easy to mix up the data because it's not labeled. So a lot of times if you're getting two separate times and you are on that lab uh, from the old photo gates, if you mix up those times, well, your whole lab is ruined. It, it can't be done. Uh, and then you have to m manually type in all of those values into Desmos to get a graph. Now, after that, uh, now that I got the Vernier lab quest, there's a force probe connected to LabQuest, so they can use that to find exactly how much force is going down the ramp. There's no more estimate there, so you're eliminating a major source of error in the lab. 
Um, and all the photo gates are connected to LabQuest. And LabQuest is super easy to navigate and see. It will show you time for this photo gate, time for that photo gate. And then it will show you the graphs right there. So instead of the students having to go manually type this in on Desmos, it automatically gives them all the points that they need and all the graphs that they need. So then they can get those graphs and analyze them uh, overwhelmingly easier. Um, so some of the effects uh, that I was hoping it would have is faster, more efficient labs. Uh, like I said, if there's less time on procedures and collecting the data, they have more time to analyze, they can get more trials, um, and they can finish it faster. Uh, and then the focus could then move from kind of the setup of the lab and the procedure the procedures of the lab to the stuff that would actually benefit them more, which is the data analysis skills. Um, technology experience, like I said, uh, you're going to be dealing with more advanced technology, so it gives you a chance to get exposed to better technology for the future uh, and possibly collaborations. I didn't get to any of this year, uh, but the other teachers could also use this potentially like a math class could look at the data. Uh, they could look at the graphs and say, hey, I could use this uh, and then start using these sensors in their class as well, uh, and we could kind of co-teach a lesson. Um, so for the results so far, um, just like formative wise in my observation, uh, more of the qualitative data, the labs are overwhelmingly quicker. I mean, it's not even close. Uh, and the lab that I'm gonna talk about here in a second that we ran with, it was the Momentum Lab. Uh, and in past years, the Momentum Lab's taken me anywhere from five to six days to do. Uh, and that makes it almost borderline, like should I even do it, is it worth it? Um, this year, the, the students that used the Vernier LabQuest finished in three. So you're shaving off literally half the time, uh, and they still did more trials than what I have in previous years. So they collected more data in half the time. Um, it's overwhelmingly easier to work with. It's basically a plug and play. You can plug it into your computer, and it will automatically read you the stuff. It'll give you the graphs, the data points. It's so much easier. And that gives you more time to work on the analysis, which is the important part. Uh, and that's the emphasis of any science test at this point is uh, data analysis. Um, so that's a big thing. Um, so some of the data that we can look at uh, quantitatively is the ACT uh, did increase this year and I did have some juniors that used it. Um, it's a little bit harder to kind of see how that's gonna take effect just out of one year. So hopefully in years uh, in the future we can continue to look at the trend lines of the ACT science portion. Um, and then the average test score actually increased by 5% on average from the previous years I've used the sensors. So I looked back at the last class's um, unit assessments, specifically the questions aimed at kind of the, the topics that we would get from these labs, uh, and the results were much better. It's 5% increase this year. I imagine it would, it would continue to increase. Uh, the more efficiently I learn to use them. Um, so just based on that data itself, uh, just the qualitative and quantitative data, I would say that this was a, a pretty big success for the first year. Um, and so uh, I just wanted to kind of wrap up by talking about one of the labs uh, that I kind of already foreshadowed to, and that was the Momentum Lab. Uh, and how I know that the lab quest made such a big difference is where I only had three that I could buy, because they are kind of expensive, uh, I had to have two groups that use the old sensors. So I really could run kind of an experiment with it where I had the new sensors and the old sensors. Um, I made the LabQuest groups run five runs per trial instead of three runs per trial uh, because it was easier for them to collect the data. Um, so they actually did you know, quite a bit more uh, than the actual old sensor groups. Uh, and they still finished overwhelmingly quicker. Uh, and not just that they finished quicker, but their data was much better. So if you look at the data right here, uh, this was the data sheet that the students used, and this was the old sensors. So if you look at this, I could only give them three runs. And if you look back at the main bottom at cell F10, you can see where I, I'm asking them to see the total momentum of the system before and after, and then looking at that percent change. The percent change and the difference is, a, is the most important part uh, 
of the lab and it's the most important parts of the analysis. So if you look at the percent change of this, it's negative 15%, which isn't terrible, but then it jumps up to 290% and then it jumps back down to negative 1%. Uh, so the findings are super inconsistent. They're jumping around. The percent changes are constantly different. Um, so that's with the old sensors. So now if you look at the exact same thing with the new sensors, and I grabbed this data a little bit before from one of my students before she was finished, uh, but it's a huge difference here. So you, if you can look back at the exact same uh, thing, the total momentum at the bottom, and this one it's uh, cell E10, and then you look over at I10 at the percent change, it's negative six, negative five, negative two. They're all right there and they're all very, very small. And we wanted those to, to explain the uh, concepts that they needed to learn. I needed those to be really, really small. Uh, so this worked overwhelmingly better. The data showed the relationship that I wanted it to much better because there was less error associated with it. Uh, so I'm excited to continue. Next year I plan on buying one or two more and that way every group can use these new sensors. Um, and I'm really excited about the findings that I had uh, for my grant. Hello, I'm Stephanie May from Belfry High School, ATC in Pike County, Kentucky. My grant was whiteboard tables in the health science classroom. My innovation for transformation was, I am part of a health science pathway in our high school, which is primarily an industry-led classroom. So what happened is I had visited the classroom of a colleague, um, I seen her whiteboard tables and I became very intrigued. I knew that I wanted our students to experience this collaborative learning opportunity in our health science classroom as a way to transition them into more hands-on approach within our classroom. So the questions were how could I best incorporate um, our practices for hands-on application as well as collaborative learning all while reaching the industry certification standards. Um, and of course we knew there would be obstacles that we would face getting the students used to being able to take the notes on the whiteboard table use those notes as they are performing their tasks and then overcoming those obstacles. And then we wanted to make sure that this would be the best route for our health science students. We were able to secure all of our materials within the boundaries of our uh, loan amounts. Of course, um, our lumber was a little bit more expensive, so we were able to shave a little bit off of some of the um, other prices in order to hit our price range. We were planning to let our ATC students be able to construct these tables, which absolutely was the best thing we could have done because it provided them with an opportunity and it also allowed them to give back to the school. We were able to add nine of the five by 30 tables into the health science classroom. On each one of those tables, they have a caddy which holds their dry erase materials um, their markers and things that they may need um, within the classroom. So what, what we found out with the research was that we knew that small collaborative groups would increase communication among the students. So we were able to pair the verbal and the written information along with the visual information in an effort to increase their recall. So what happened is, as you can see right here in, in the pictures, this one is an example of students that were giving some demonstrations and we would move from one table to the next and they would add. It made it a whole lot easier instead of having to use paper pencil, we were able to over here, the students were able to draw using the whiteboard tables. So it was a very good opportunity for the students to share out their information um, with others in the classroom as well. In our emergency procedures classes where that we chose to base our outcomes on. And as you'll look over here and see, this was the students using, of course, um, laptops and paper versus being able to take notes here on the whiteboard on the tables and then being able to perform 
their skills alongside of what they had written down. Because in our emergency procedures class, it is a complete hands-on approach. So whenever the students are completing their CPR certification, they're allowable, allowed to use notes, they're allowed to use um, materials that they have while they were taking the course and they were watching the videos. So this has absolutely increased the ability of the students to recall the information and to perform it. I will also have to add that we did not have any student that performed any less than satisfactory and every student completed their rotation with a 92% on their uh, final exam. So this project was definitely one that has been a benefit to our classroom and we have absolutely had a wonderful opportunity being able to engage and um, to provide this opportunity for Hello, uh, my name is uh, Justin Smith and I am the uh, current agriculture teacher here at uh, the Floyd County School of Innovation. Uh, and our uh, KBEC uh, grant project was titled Mountains of Produce and it is a raised bed gardening project that we have come up with here for the school. So uh, our inspiration for the project uh, was that we really want to get students um, in the building uh, engaged and, and getting to experience some hands-on learning uh, opportunities with this project. Uh, agriculture is, is a very hands-on topic and so we really wanted uh, the, our, our new students for this new program to be able to experience that. Uh, one of our other goals was to engage the community so through this project once we get it completely done and start to harvest our crops we'd love to be able to engage the community by selling them um, farm fresh or raised bed fresh uh, vegetables from uh, right here in Floyd County. And then uh, I wanted the students to be able to gain a sense of ownership and pride over this project because uh, in the program's first year here, uh, these students have went above and beyond in getting us off on the right foot. And they really uh, have knocked pretty much everything we've done this semester and last semester out of the park. And I knew that they would be able to handle this project really well. And I think that uh, they were the perfect bunch to kind of spearhead uh, uh, this time uh, for our raised beds. So uh, they've done a great job and, and I think they've uh, really taken it and ran with it too. So uh, our purpose again was we wanted to make sure we were teaching work ethic and hard work over um, kind of along with our standards um, and make it a little more hands-on uh, just because classroom instruction is very important but it can be uh, kind of monotonous and boring at times. So we want to take what we're learning in the classroom and uh, transplant that to outside, whether that was in our raised beds uh, or um, in our container farm or any other way we can. Uh, and then we definitely wanted to help students uh, build some skills they can use later on in life. Uh, most of my students um, can and, and have capabilities and already planning to have gardens or um, raised bed gardens at their at their own homes, uh, which is pretty cool. So they can definitely use these skills um, further down the road, uh, as well as coming up with this growing season. Uh, so the money was spent um, to purchase materials to build the raised beds. Uh, we actually built a, a kind of like a starter kit. Um, so it is just kind of uh, some sheet metal uh, that was molded into like an oval shape, <clears throat> which really fits our style here um, in Floyd County well because we're up on top of a hill. And so if we should need to move these raised beds or uh, uh, reuse them or anything like that, we can, we have the capability to do so with the ones that we bought. Um, so it was a really good purchase, I think, for using our grant funds um, for this first year. And I can definitely see us uh, reusing them um, every year as part of my greenhouse class. Uh, we bought some uh, garden tools just to start off with um, and that'll help us work with the soil. Uh, it'll help us keep the weeds down and manage those weeds um, and allow students kind of to see what each tool is used for and, and why we need those if we're having a garden. Uh, then we bought some seeds, soil, and fertilizer. Uh, we made sure that we got everything we needed for the plants to grow uh, properly. Uh, and then lastly, bought a water hose and a spray nozzle just 
uh, in case Mother Nature doesn't take care of the watering for us, we will have the capabilities to make sure they have plenty of water and that we're all set on that front. So that is how we spent our grant money. Um, so moving on to the planning. Um, this is where the bulk of the work was done uh, and started to be done by the students. Um, so the students were um, the ones that chose what vegetables we we're going to grow. Um, we actually had a seed ID project uh, where the students had to kind of look at cards, identify what seeds um, in the, what plants in the pictures uh, would match with the seeds on the cards. And uh, they did really well with that. So that, that helped them kind of figure out what plants they wanted to grow. Um, and we talked about what was there a market for in Floyd County? What uh, would people like to eat or buy to eat the most? And that helped in their decision. And I'll tell you more about what vegetables were growing later. Uh, students selected the raised bed location. We learned in class about uh, kind of the weather patterns and our growing season here in Kentucky and how long, how many hours of daylight we have. And uh, then we went outside and we actually just looked where the sun was hitting uh, during our class. And that helped students decide like, okay, well, we need to probably put the raised beds towards the back part of the school because they get the most sun there, um, which was uh, a very good idea. So that is where we ended up putting them. And you'll see some pictures very soon. Um, students researched the plant sizes to determine um, the proper spacing. So we wanna make sure that plants have plenty of spacing and when we were measuring out the raised beds, we wanted to make sure that they had plenty of room to walk around the raised beds because we will need to work on them or work in them uh, in the future. And then uh, finally there, the students measured and cut landscape cloth uh, that we placed under the raised beds. Um, and this will kind of do um, one main thing for us, and that is to keep the weeds from coming up uh, from under uh, the raised beds to the top. So we wanted to make sure that we're trying to control our weed problem as, uh, as much as we can. Um, and we thought that landscape cloth would be a, a, good tr uh, a good experiment this year and we'll see if it works. So if it doesn't work, then we'll definitely reuse the raised beds and try something new next year uh, and see, see if we can't get that to, to remedy uh, our weed problems. So uh, those were, that was the bulk of our planning. Um, here is the seed identification uh, project we did in class. We uh, took a day and kind of looked at the seeds and talked about um, uh, seed identification and seed parts and anatomy. And then we identified the, some of the common vegetable seeds that you would have grown in the garden around here. So those are students um, in class uh, working in groups to figure out what seeds match up with what vegetables or fruits. Uh, and then we have next uh, how students were assessed. Um, so we uh, assessed students throughout the project based on their active participation. Um, they had to help assemble the raised beds, um, which was really good for them on, you know, we had instructions and they had to read the instructions and decide how the pieces fit together. Um, and they used tools to put those pieces together, which was really interesting. And, and they got to do a lot of hands-on learning with that uh, actually putting together raised beds, which was great. Uh, and then the preparation of raised beds was also uh, really hands-on because we were mixing soil. Uh, we actually mixed some sand with our soil and, and we had a whole soil science lesson about that and why we needed some of that sand just to make sure the water could move through the soil without staying in it and causing too much moisture to build up. And so the students really enjoyed mixing the soil up and then putting it into the raised beds. Uh, classroom instruction has supplemented our project all the way through. Um, I tried to uh, keep my lessons um, geared towards what we were doing with the raised beds so that everything would kind of fit together as we move through this semester. And then students are going to write a final reflection for this project as a wrap up. So that'll be kind of like the main overarching assessment for the students. Um, and as I said before, they've been assessed throughout the whole time um, with their participation and any handout, handouts or activities we've done in class that have went along with our classroom instruction. So uh, here's some pictures of the raised bed assembly. So you can see I've had a couple of different classes working on this uh, when we were going through it. Um, so they were working in uh, large groups um, to kind of put each raised bed together. Um, 
and they did a fantastic job uh, reading instructions, making sure that uh, they were being safe with some of the tools and pliers they were using, um, and uh, getting these things put together. And then this is what the finished product looks like. Um, we think these will be great for us again because we can pick them up and move them every year if we need to. So if this spot, particularly on our school grounds, doesn't work out, we can move them somewhere else and try again. So it's not like uh, this is a kind of like a stationary, uh, you know, one and done type of deal. So um, I'm pretty happy that we were able to get the grant and, and purchase this specific raised bed uh, kit. Uh, here is a picture of the students placing and filling our raised beds up. Um, so uh, we, uh, as you can see, we used a wheelbarrow to mix the soil. We had uh, some of the students with shovels there mixing it up uh, and then placing it into our raised bed. Um, so again, it is at the back of our school where hopefully it gets the most sunlight. Um, and we used uh, just straight up raised bed uh, soil mix. Um, but in the future, I think it'd be a very cool project to actually do different soils for each raised bed and have the students kind of experiment with which soil uh, produced the best plants. So that may be something to look forward to uh, next year and years to come. We have not, there are no pictures of us planting seeds yet or of our harvest because um, if you are a gardener or, or have started a garden, um, then you probably have just started your garden or uh, are thinking about it uh, or are about to because our weather has been crazy and uh, we uh, have also um, kind of waited until uh, the last week of April or early May to plant just because that's when we think it'll be the best um, for our uh, vegetables. Uh, we do plan to do things a little bit differently though. We, we will not start our seeds in the raised beds. We will actually um, start our seeds in our app harvest container farm. Um, so they get a really great start and then we will transplant them over to the raised beds to make sure that they are, are uh, gonna get the best start possible. Uh, and then we, the students have decided that we will plant uh, tomatoes, uh, two varieties, beef steak, uh, which is like your sandwich or burger tomato, and then Roma tomatoes, which are uh, kind of like smaller and oval um, looking little tomatoes. Uh, and then we will plant cucumbers, banana peppers, uh, and one I left off here that we may or may not plant, the students haven't decided uh, if we have any room, but uh, some collard greens uh, there was a couple boys that like collard greens and they said they wanted to plant some so that one may be planted may not we'll see uh, and then for the raised bed management how we're going to keep uh, keep working with the project uh, again we'll use the grant funding to purchase garden tools uh, which will be used to manage the weeds uh, and turn the soil over to make sure our plants are, are in the best conditions possible uh, students are going to um, continuously be working to uh, manage our plants, prune them back, make sure no insects are getting at them. Uh, that was a big unit we just got through was the integrated pest management IPM unit. And so we are, uh, we looked at uh, kind of different insects that attack uh, plants and garden vegetables. And so now our students are, are ready to keep an eye out for those type of things. Um, and then students will attend scheduled garden work days in the summer to manage our raised beds and harvest our crop. Um, so we'll, we'll schedule some days throughout the summer where they can come in, work in the garden, work in the container farm and harvest our vegetables uh, and, and hopefully get some good, uh, good work experience and, and some good hours in at school. So uh, to market our vegetables, uh, we plan to sell our vegetables to our local community members, uh, whether that be uh, just through word of mouth uh, or uh, the local farmer's market. And I'm currently working on connecting with our farmer's market here in Floyd County. Uh, and then the students will also create a social media post about our, uh, on our FFA Facebook page to advertise our vegetables. So um, we have uh, some awesome students who are also our uh, chapter FFA officers and um, they will be kind of in charge of running our FFA Facebook page to advertise what we've done and what we have for sale. So uh, the students will be deciding uh, the price points on those vegetables uh, based off of current value at the store and uh, kind of what it costs to, for us to 
uh, actually produce the vegetables themselves. So uh, next year we kind of have all this stuff already made with like a price list and all that good stuff. Um, okay, so that brings me to the future plans. Um, again, this project was super fun to, to lead and, and see the students go through this, this semester. Um, I think we will definitely continue to use this each year uh, so long as I'm teaching the greenhouse technology class. It's a great, great project for them to get their hands on uh, with some uh, gardening skills. Um, I think the students have definitely enjoyed it. Uh, they enjoy being outside, getting their, uh, getting some hands on learning in. And uh, most of them, like I said earlier, have told me that they plan to use uh, some of the stuff we've learned in class with their own gardens. Um, so we did, uh, we did soil tests and we tested their own garden soil and uh, all this extra fun stuff that we've done with our, our raised bed project. So I think it's turned out really great. Uh, and I definitely uh, plan to use it again in the future. So I did my project on uh, creative problem solving in 3D um, where I purchased uh, a 3D printer along with a computer to run the software and um, wanted to see um, how that would affect the learning in my art classes. So the problem um, that I was trying to address is student creativity during the problem solving uh, method. Uh, a lot of students, um, particularly in art class, really struggle with Creative, uh, creatively thinking, thinking through uh, potential problems, uh, sticking with it. Um, and I wanted to create a scenario where students would be faced with a problem. They would have to um, ideate, uh, come up with um, solutions, uh, various solutions, and then choose one and uh, use that for a design uh, project with the 3D printers. So my research questions were, uh, does the 3D printer help students become more engaged in the creative process? And do students exhibit creative problem solving skills through innovation of new products or solutions? So I, uh, my action plan was to do this sometime between November and March. I ended up doing this project uh, the middle of January. It just worked out in my schedule to do that with my Art 2 class. And so, um, we started with um, uh, talking about artists who are also inventors. So we talked about Leonardo da Vinci um, and how um, he came up with um, novel ideas uh, to solve certain um, problems and issues he saw. And then some that were just completely brand new and, uh, you know, such as the idea of like a helicopter or parachutes, things that were way beyond his time. And so we, we talked about him as a, not only an artist, but an inventor. And then I posed a, a problem uh, to them and told them to, um, uh, we were going to focus on, our problem was going to be on endangered species. And so I showed them a video um, from PBS, great lesson plan um, that was that's free and available to anyone out there. And it was about using 3D printers to solve an issue uh, per pertaining to uh, sea turtles. And so in the video, uh, the um, creator of the problem solver, if you will, uh, came up with the solution of 3D printing um, eggs. Uh, the same size and shape as the turtle eggs because the one of the reasons why um, turtles were going um, or being endangered uh, in that particular area was because of poachers um, taking their eggs um, and selling them at market. And so they came up with the idea to put a tracker inside the egg and, and do that. So I presented that to my students. Then I had them do um, some brainstorming activities uh, with peers. Uh, I actually ended up making this a group project uh, because I thought that might spark more um, discussions and ideas and creative sharing, uh, which in a personal way really helps me uh, to do that. 
uh, to shoot ideas off of people. And so I thought that might be a good way to kind of introduce this kind of um, problem solving with my students. So once they did that, uh, then I did a very brief um, introduction to the 3D design platform we use. We use Tinkercad um, because it was uh, available uh, for all students, so whether they had a computer or not. Uh, and it was web-based uh, where it would save their progress in the cloud. Uh, and so we, um, what I did, I um, basic, showed them the basics and had them play around with it first. Uh, because I felt like um, students might learn better if they just, as the name of the program is, tinker around with it. Um, and so I kind of showed them basics, like here's how to, you know, place an item, here's how to combine items, um, and then have them kind of just play around with it. And then they used this program uh, to come up with uh, designs for um, their particular endangered species. So they chose an endangered species. So I shared with them uh, the um, endangered species list. They chose one from there. They did research to find out um, where um, the animal was from, what were the three main factors that uh, were causing their uh, endangerment. And then they also um, had to choose one of those issues to address. So just like with the sea turtle, uh, there's multiple things causing um, the endangerment of the sea turtle, but um, they chose to do the poaching um, in that particular video I showed my students. And so I said, you know, there's going to be multiple reasons why endangered species are going ex um, are going endangered, um, and it's usually complex reasons. Uh, but focus on one thing that you think you can solve through design. And so um, that's what I did. And so they, they did their design. And so um, for my data analysis, and um, I did observations. So just walking around, which I typically do in my class anyways, um, engaging with students, just watching, observing, seeing what they're doing, uh, taking some notes over um, their engagement and um, how they're doing with the project. Um, and then the... Um, then also student products. So the two questions, essentially, to answer my um, questions, is was there evidence of more student engagement because of using the 3D printer? Because I thought, you know, this is a really cool new technology. Maybe students will be more engaged with that. And sadly, um, I witnessed about the same amount of engagement during this project as compared compared to, to other projects. So like with a lot of art projects, um, some students will be really engaged with certain types and then others will be really engaged with others. Some kids really like drawing, some really like sculpting. Um, some are just engaged all the time because they just love creating. Um, and since I have a wide range of um, abilities in my class, I saw that equally with the 3D printing, but it did engage some students who were less engaged with say painting. Um, so there were, were some um, positives out of it, but overall, um, <laughs> students were still on the same level. It didn't really boost their engagement necessarily. Um, so I have some potential explanations for that. Um, one is just the overall disengagement I've noticed with students this year in technology, because they had to depend so much on it the past two years with um, the, the shutdown in March 2020 and then the whole entire um, crazy hybrid virtual year and switching and all that. Um, and it, I feel like students just got really burnt out with technology. The other thing too is um, most adults assume that because um, students are tech savvy on one of these things, um, on their cell phone, that that translates over to um, computers and that's not the case. I figured that out last year um, and just trying to walk students through various technology um, issues. Um, and so I think they just got really disengaged um, with using technology. Um, and so it wasn't novel, it wasn't cool, it wasn't new, it wasn't something different. Um, and so I, I think that's part of the reason um, as well. I also think part of it is, um, like I said, it's due to the fact that they really are not computer savvy, they're phone savvy. Um, and it's um, a lot of students when they don't feel confident 
in their abilities to do something, uh, they're very hesitant. I say that a lot in art class. I have kids who say, I'm, I'm not an artist. Um, and so that's a big roadblock that I have to overcome. And I feel like that's the same kind of thing here with the, the technology. I also think another um, potential explanation is that um, students really struggle with open-ended tasks, um, and especially with unfamiliar materials. So I said just recently, like the technology is unfamiliar. Uh, using a 3D modeling uh, program is unfamiliar. And combining the, um, <laughs> the lack of familiarity with open-ended problems really trips some kids up. And I think a part of that is because students really like a scripted, I want to do this, 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 and this, and I can cross it off my list and I can do it and I will get a grade. And when you challenge them to do higher order thinking, a lot of times you hear crickets <laughs> in your classroom. And uh, in an art classroom, uh, the thing that most students wanna do is, is mimic what they see, which is great for learning skills, but when you try to push them creatively, uh, then there's sometimes a lot of um, pushback. Uh, they struggle. They just they don't um, feel confident in their ability to um, problem solve or to be creative. However, the student um, products did show some creative um, problem solving. So I have a couple images here. I have um, some off the program. Um, I actually printed these off and then totally forgot to take pictures. <laughs> So you're getting the 3D uh, versions turned into me before um, they got printed on the, the printer and then one actual 3D printing. So did they exhibit creativity in their solutions to the problem? Yes. Now, some with further prompting, um, some of them wanted to do just really rudimentary ideas. And so I would walk around as they were kind of coming up and brainstorming their ideas and I would push them a little more uh, to come up with uh, more novel ideas, things that you know, uh, would be um, really innovative and not just, ah, someone's done this before, let's just do it again. So some uh, came up with ideas such as this is a leaf bug. Um, so the idea for this one is to serve as a surveillance device. So you would put a um, camera inside of it and it would work just like a, a typical bug. So it would fly and blend in um, like a, um, like a leaf and could hide and watch um, potential predators, uh, poachers, that sort of thing. This particular device, uh, this might be one of the most creative ones without me <laughs> urging them on. Um, this student and their partner came up with the idea um, to, uh, because one of the issues for their species was um, flooding um, because of climate change. Uh, flooding is becoming more prominent in that particular region. And so they thought, well, it would be kind of cool to do something like a dam, but instead of it being solid, you would open and close, um, that it, you could have a mechanism to open and close according to certain water amounts so that it would open if it needed to release um, some water, like during a, a potentially rainy season, but then close if the water um, downstream was getting too much and could pose an issue for the particular animal that they were trying to protect, uh, which I thought was a really cool idea. And they have it to where it's blocks. So this could be um, done in a variety of places. So you just make them and you put them together, uh, kind of like a Lego set. Um, so you could adjust it to whatever the width of the stream or river was. So it could be used in other um, locales as well. Uh, so I thought that one was a really cool idea. Another idea, and this one is one that I had to prompt a little bit. And so this one was for, uh, if I remember correctly, it was for um, seals, a certain species of seals that's um, going extinct um, or on the verge of going to going extinct. And the original idea was to put a speaker um, to that had a motion sensor on it that would release a sound to scare off potential predators uh, or poachers which was fine, but I said, hey, you know, you could, anyone could put a speaker on a, you know, thing, but it, then it's also going to be really obvious <laughs> to a human um, that that's there, if they're a poacher, and so I said, what, 
what are some other ways you could do the same concept of like having that alarm that sound to like scare off people uh but in a new and innovative way um and so they're like well um there's seagulls there i was like okay well how can you combine the two you know the the fact that they're seagulls which would be you know because they first said rocks i was like yeah it's kind of boring what are what are some you know other animals or things there that you could hide this device in and so they came up with um using a seagull um that would be like mechanical but look like a real seagull that would have a speaker system built into it um so you can kind of see the little speaker they designed inside the the seagull um and that would uh sound the alarm so that was a once with some urging um, we got them to a really cool and uh, novel idea um, there. So with some guidance, um, I think students can get there. And I think some sc students are just gifted and they already have a good self-efficacy towards creativity, while others need to learn um, how to be uh, creative. So some of my final thoughts. Um, one is uh, do a little bit more step-by-step -step method of teaching the software to build confidence. I um I feel like just tinkering around <laughs> um didn't help some students. They need more structure. Um so I really think differentiation's the the way to go here. Um students who are good at like learning things on their own, uh you could totally have them do that. Whereas um some students need that here's step A, step B, step C. Um I also think um using the traditional media, so uh I think having students design um, and do drawings first can help them think through um, the different aspects of what they're designing and to think in three dimensions because um, I know through my experience students really struggle with 3D. Um, it's, easier for, it's easier for them to draw than it is to, for them to think of a 3D model or a sculpture even. Um, so doing some sort of traditional medium, maybe even using um, Play-Doh or something like that so they can think in three dimensions as well and do a little um, model before they actually do the 3D modeling. And then I think the other things, I think some students were just not engaged because they are not necessarily passionate about um, endangered species. Um, it was just a, a an idea that I saw um, and used. Um, not a lot of students were really super engaged in saving, you know, the rhinoceros or the seal or whatever, um, whereas others were. Um, so I think finding ways to connect lessons uh, to concepts and problems um, that they're passionate about uh, would be better uh, to engage them. Um, so finding more ways to differentiate, finding um, a balance between um, letting students just kind of figure things out on their own and having some sort of framework. Uh, these are all things that I did discover um, from this. So um, in my endeavor to figure out how to re-engage students after COVID, um, we're, you know, we're learning a few things. Uh, so uh, I think um, finding, tapping into their passion tapping into um, what they're interested in, I think is is really going to be the key um, moving forward and, and making it applicable to real life. Um, I, I did find that um, having students make these because it related to a real world problem did um, catch, capture their attention, um, but really learning how to help them maintain their attention. I think the two years of um, COVID protocols and the weird virtual learning really um, made it hard for them uh, to re-engage with long-term projects that they have to continuously work on and, and finalize. Um, but that's my findings. Um, so thanks again to the um, FIRE Summit. Um, for the opportunity to share my research and for the innovative um, grant. Um, I really enjoyed learning the 3D modeling and printing myself. And I know my students are getting more and more excited, um, especially since they know they can find <laughs> um, and make new files um, and continue printing. So thank you for um, listening to my presentation.
Hey, my name is uh, Joanna Thompson, art teacher at Hazard High School. We, uh, our project was the Bulldog Metal Refinery and Pottery Works. We kind of, we got started with uh, just the blacksmithing part and it's taken us quite a while to learn that um, kind of aspect of the metal work. The students have been working for a full year, just trying to learn how to bend the metal, how to make the different hooks the different metals, just the fire in itself. So I'll kind of go into it, but it's just, it's been a learning experience, but I'll start into my PowerPoint. So we plan for the metalwork program to expand. Uh, the plan was to incorporate welding into it. But at this point, it's taken us so long to learn how to you know, do the metal work that it's it's going to be a little bit longer. So we will eventually learn how to do that part. Uh, we have been, you know, the kids have been, uh, the students that have been working with the metal smithing program have done excellent as far as like, they just keep working. They don't stop, but it is just taking so much time to learn the process of blacksmithing that it's going to take time to actually uh, incorporate the welding a little bit later, but we're eventually going to do it. Um, and then I should have, hopefully, I'll put under, you know, the holler, I'll put another video where we've actually welded everything together. And just the students are growing. Uh, they, they love it. They love doing it. It's just, it's even for me, because I was in there actually helping them uh, to learn how to, to make everything. And it it takes a lot of muscle. <laughs> it takes a lot of um, just knowledge. We've had blacksmiths to come in um, to work with us, and I'll show you those in, here in a second, a little bit later in the PowerPoint. The examples of metal work would be the hooks, which we've, that's our first project, and we've got that done down pat pretty good. Uh, we're still learning different techniques with that. The flower pot holders, we have not got to that point yet, but we're going to, so we can actually weld those hooks together, maybe make a kind of like stands to put uh, flowers and plants on. And that's what the students are kind of like focused on. Uh, sales downtown at the farmer's market. We actually did our first farmer's market uh, this past week. Um, actually yesterday, it went very well. The kids, they sold, sold some things. It was three to four students actually down there selling. So, but, Thursdays on a triangle is something we're definitely going to try to make sure that we put into the program, the art station, and that way the, the students get exposure for their work and selling their work. So here's examples of student uh, work with students working with the blacksmiths that came. Um, so you see, you have to have it outside. So our biggest problem with working is the elements. Of course, it's so cold outside that there was some weeks we couldn't even get outside because it's so cold. So that put a little kind of back um, planning on our part to, okay, when it gets pretty, we gotta get back out there and we gotta keep working. But the blacksmiths coming in, this is uh, Merritt and Bob, and they did excellent as far as like showing the kids the process of uh, bending the metal. I mean, it was totally awesome. Uh, just. To going over the tools, the hammers, I didn't even know there was different names to hammers until they started talking about the different tools that they have, but very impressed with it, and definitely it's a vocabulary the kids need to learn, and they did learn, um, but they're still growing, I'm still growing, and this is it's not easy, <laughs> but we, we're learning. Here is a video. This is going to be one of my students. Um, he actually is working with the anvil and our setup is getting better as far as like where we have the anvil at. Um, you know, you want to be able to have it a little bit higher up. So we did put that on a stand. So that's a lot better. But I'll go ahead and play the video so you can see it. And that uh, young man, he, he's been really working 
he, you know, he'll get the stuff, get out there, him and another student, and they'll just, you know, get the fire going, get the tools out, um, have the metal ready to go. So, and that's toward like the last probably month, they've actually gotten better about just getting out there. You know, I only have to tell them, they go on out. Okay, here is our cell that we did downtown yesterday. So it's a setup. I gotta get better about presentation. So I'm gonna look on some things with Amazon, maybe buy uh, better tablecloths, uh, bags to put everything in. But right here, you can also you can see uh, we had four hooks. So this is something that they successfully made. They got the hose drilled into them. And then uh, one of them did sell. So that, that's, that's progress for, you know, for what we're doing. And my big objective was to incorporate it into the student's pottery sale as well. And we got one young lady that likes to do jewelry. So we had some of her work there to sell as well. But here's the students that were down there. This is at the farmer's market. So you can see they're set up, they're selling. Um, and once we got set up, I kind of showed them what to do, how to wrap the, the pottery, everything, the items. Um, you know, put it in a bag, how to take the money, where the money was. Um, we would label it, have a notebook under their name. We put like the price of what they sold. That way I knew how much to give them at the end of the sale. And after I showed them, I just kind of walked away. <laughs> so that way they were actually, you know, trying to make it an entrepreneurial type program, mentorship. So they're making the wares, uh, ceramics, you know, jewelry we can include that and metal works so hopefully the metal works will grow and we'll be able to sell like a variety of different things for uh, the arts crafts program and but we also we have a lot of 2d artists that i'd like to include one day into this but you can see you know very successful the kids they really get into it they love it but this is this is showing you some examples of what we do have down at Town Hazard. And there are the hooks a little bit closer up. So you see, we still got, I mean, they made the hooks. We still got a little bit of, you know, as far as craftsmanship to go, uh, cleaning them up and everything. Um, just that takes a lot of motivation. <laughs> so getting toward the end of school, motivation's kind of going downhill, but we'll get there. Um, so the kids are already talking about talking about days actually being there the summer in summertime I could open the studio up and they could actually work and I'd be present while they're working um, so they're they're already they're ready for school to be out but then they're also ready to come back and work in the studio as well after they take a break and that is it thank you for watching this presentation Hi, I'm Emily Warren. I am a teacher at Johnson Central High School, and this is my presentation called Caviar Taste on a Fish Stick Budget. We, the problem really came to light in the spring of 2019. A quick review of um, what the research project was. My kids, we were getting ready to do Shrek the Musical. Uh, much to our advantage and yet disadvantage, uh, Netflix had posted the musical, the Broadway version, and my kids, of course, see Broadway costumes and that's what they want. That's the caviar taste of it. And then we have the, well, our budget, which is like the fish stick budget. Um, so they were determined, which is great. Um, you always want kids to find a problem and solve it, and that's where we were. So they wanted professional looking costumes. We had minimal money and renting was out of the question. So for that particular skirt, sorry, let me review here. For that particular skirt, that's the fairy godmother. The kids really fell in love with it. Um, they rerouted and they came up with a really creative solution which included hand cutting each petal. They stiffened them by laying them in a handmade form and then they painted each petal. Everything was ready and it's time to attach it to the hoop skirt. And um, we didn't have a sewing machine. So they tried gluing them oh the problems <laughs> so we were so close that the skirt looked gorgeous um it didn't survive okay um we did not have nor could we afford the equipment to finish the problem or to finish the product um so like i said we glued them 
and it lasted until the end of the show, but not without alterations after every show. And sometimes we do two to three shows a day. So after every viewing of the show, we were fixing that skirt, um, which brought my research question. Does providing students with the proper tools and technology encourage them to become problem solvers? And the simple answer is yes, absolutely. Um, according to Megan Brenneman and Martha Stewart, and now my kids um, in the picture uh, on the far end there, Martha Stewart and uh, Megan Brenneman believe that sewing and teaching sewing does the following things in the column on the left. So relieving stress, um, saving money, becoming more resourceful, increasing confidence, increasing creativity, uh, increasing patience and perseverance, developing problem solving skills, giving a feeling of accomplishment, uh, practicing math skills, so cross-curricular, and hand-eye coordination. Um, by the time we got to our major sewing unit, my, my class was quite scaled down, but we had um, six kids and we had six machines, so worked perfect. Um, the six kids who did the majority of the sewing, I had a few more in there, but they worked on set and props, but the six who did the majority of the sewing, they um, answered whether or not they felt like these things had increased and whatnot. If you notice like relief stress, only half of them said that it relieved stress. Uh, we had a couple cases of tears, you know, but it happens. Um, but, you know, everyone saw how money saving it was and everyone noticed that they became much more resourceful and definitely felt accomplished. Um, okay, let's see here. These are some pictures. There we are. Um, of our kids working, learning different skills. This is throughout the year. Um, and to begin with, my students created North Pole Elf costumes for their production of Elf. We have what we wanted to the left-hand side and what we came up with on the right, and I would say they did a very, very good job. I was very pleased. Uh, past December, we have decided to do Aladdin. It was not originally our chosen show, but it's the one we went to. So the students have been sewing harem pants and obi belts, and I think that's how you pronounce that, and um, tails and wings for Iago the bird. Um, that's an example of one of the wings that has been sewn by the students. So they've also, you know, they've made some things from scratch, but they've also altered um, several garments that were bought at local thrift stores or donated to our program to match our, uh, match our setting of Agrabah. Because um, at one point a girl was so comfortable with sewing that I was able to just set her loose and I said, here's a video on YouTube about how to change, uh, turn a long skirt into harem pants. And here's a long skirt we found for cheap. So give it a try. And it turned out perfect. Um, the lady who taught with us, Mrs. Sandra Arrowwood, was thoroughly impressed with the level of not only creativity that the kids have shown, but also with the products they've made. So um, measuring our success. Um, one thing we wanted is, do we have elf costumes for next year's production? And yes, we do. These held up, and they will hold up for many, many years. And not only that, but what I love about them is they're versatile. So it doesn't matter, like, what size um, a cast me a member is, that um, costume is going to fit. So we're going to have them for many years to come, and it fits all sizes of cast members. Okay, so did our costumes, another um, thing I said we would measure our success is did our costumes survive the spring musical, which, uh, which generally endure more wear and tear than Elf the Musical? Well, we have postponed our show, <laughs> so only time will tell on this. Um, the costumes are looking, they're all in progress and they're looking great, but um, their durability, I mean, I would make a an educated guess that yes, they will survive for the next time we do Aladdin in many years. Um, but, you know, I don't have proof. So, um, but time will tell. 
these were some of the things the kids said about the sewing unit, which I thought was very telling. Um, helping sew so many of these costumes helped me gain the experience to be a helpful friend and coworker. Another one said they'll take this skill with them so kids see use for it in their future, which I think is really great. Um, another girl wanted to learn how to sew her own clothes and now she's got the skills to do it. Um, this, I, I love this one. This unit has really helped me to express myself and try out new things with the help of our teachers, uh, not because I was able to help with the sewing part, but, but the fact that they were willing to try new things. So many times kids don't want to step out of their box, their comfort zone, and this unit actually really um, promoted that. Um, kids enjoy working hands-on, and um, I have improved my skills with sewing, and then I've also been able to help others become more confident in sewing themselves, which is great because when kids can lead other kids, I always feel like they learn more and, um, and they feel much better about themselves. And then there was impact that I did not expect. Um, they embroidered and uh, sewed me a thank you gift, which was very sweet for the show. But one student is currently sewing her own prom dress and I am super excited to see it, but it has sparked, I think what's going to be a long lasting love of this much dying art. So I am very excited to see her dress and to see what she does going forth. But overall, um, bringing what some people would consider antiquated back um, and giving the kids the proper tools has really, they are working together so much more, bouncing ideas off each other, um, their growth and their abilities to, you know, see how things come together. And it's just been, it's been amazing. Like I am so very proud of my kids and I wish I had pictures from um, our upcoming production of Aladdin, but you can always come see it uh, May 12th through the 21st. <laughs> so anyway, um, but thank you for your time and I hope you enjoyed the presentation as much as I've enjoyed watching my kids grow. Hello, my name is Rebecca Williams and I am a STEM teacher at Ashland Middle School. And today I'm going to be sharing about our PBL Interactive Art Alley. Um, in our current educational environment, student engagement has been more challenging than ever, and many students have lost interest in the traditional instructional experience. So it's really important for us to make sure that students were fully bought in and engaged. Um, last school year, student engagement at our school was at an all-time low. And we just decided that this year really couldn't be the same. And we wanted to do whatever was possible to increase their engagement and overcome the deficiencies um, that was caused by last year. As a technology teacher, this means incorporating new technology into the classroom and providing students with the opportunity to apply it in an authentic and meaningful way. Our area of focus for this PBL was engagement and authentic learning experiences. Research shows that STEM PBLs provide the means to connect relevant real world situations uh, while still maintaining high expectations of student achievement and also increasing engagement. PBLs also um, allow students the opportunity for deeper learning and encourages them to um, create a love of learning and provides a personal connection um, to, for them to their academic experience. It also gives them the opportunity to interact with adults businesses and organizations that are in our community. Our action plan was to partner with the AKY Urban Arts Project Board and the Ashland Convention and Visitors Bureau to create immersive and interactive art exhibits around the city of Ashland. Um, then we were going to compile all of these experiences into an app that could be used to find and interact with the various murals in our city. Um, students traveled to the downtown area to tour our alley and the riverfront to work with the city officials and um, bring these exhibits to life. In order to create these experiences, we use um, we plan to use a variety of materials and resources. Um, we plan to use 3D printers and graffiti art to create and apply QR codes. We plan to use Zapworks, which was an augmented reality software to help create this immersive experience. 
Um, we plan to create Snapchat filters that were tied to specific geographic locations. Um, our intention was to use Apri.io, which is software to enable the creation of um, Android and iOS friendly apps that could be used by all. And we're also going to use video creation equipment to record interviews with the artists. Um, our project involved working with other STEM teachers and students within our building, the AKY Urban Arts Project Board, and the Ashland Convention and Visitors Bureau. At the beginning of our project, our timeline um, ran from October to April. Our plan was to have all of our materials ordered by October, to launch our event in November, and then from December to February, students were going to collaborate and develop solutions to the problem. Um, in March, we planned to hold an exhibition of learning. And then in April, our goal was to install the 3D printed QR codes in our alley and officially launch our interactive art project. Our desired outcomes um, were for students to be more engaged in their own learning and um, for students to increase their awareness about the experiences within our city and to interact with the art that is here. Implementation. So we kicked off our PBL um, by having students attend a launch event and during that event they were able to meet with members of the AKY Urban Arts Project Board and the Executive Director of the Ashland Convention and Visitors Bureau. We did um, encounter a few unforeseen obstacles uh, during the year. Our initial plan was to purchase Zapworks and Apri IO software. As I said before, Zapworks would be used to create the augmented reality experience, and Apri IO was going to be used to develop an app. However, purchasing restrictions within our district did not allow us um, to purchase the subscription based software. Uh, at that point, we decided that we should probably go a different route, and we met with a different app developer development company. Um, but the cost was too high for us. And um, we also explored some less expensive alternatives, but ultimately they did not have the functionality that we needed. We also tried another augmented reality software, but it did not work um, on our school computers due to network restrictions. The items that we were able to purchase were the materials to make the QR codes. The plan was for these to be used to direct the visitors to the app and the VR experiences. However, since the app and the experiences were not able to be developed, these codes were not implemented as intended. However, we are exploring ways that we can um, use these strategies with other projects around our school moving forward. For this project, we weren't able to fully evaluate our outcomes due to the issues with the app and the augmented reality software. However, student engagement and interest in the project was evident. During our introductory event, our students were highly engaged and interacting with the representatives from the AKY Urban Arts Project Board and the Convention and Visitors Bureau. Thanks for watching. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me. Hi, I'm Danny Vance with KVEC, the CTE and Build It Forward Consultant. In the videos to follow, you're going to hear from teachers and students from our six schools that are building tiny houses this year and see some pictures of the progress of those homes. We are really proud here at KVEC of the six schools that are building tiny houses, so just enjoy the videos to follow. Hey, I'm Kelly Clyburn. I work here at the Breath at ATC, electrical teacher, um, going on 17 years here, and uh, I believe this is our fourth tiny house and uh, got a really good crew of kids this year and we're really proud of it. Hello, my name is Connor Deaton. I'm a senior here at Breathitt County High School, one of the leaders on the Tiny House Project. We've worked really hard on it this year and I'm looking forward to finishing it and seeing what it can bring back to this program. You know, so far we've worked on our siding and stuff. We're putting up siding on the inside walls. We've got our water heater roughed in. Uh, we've got our boxes and stuff, connectors. You know, we're just working real hard and we're looking forward to getting it done and hoping that we can uh, you know, so it's somebody who's going to enjoy it. You know, we've insulated everything. Everything's been done by hand. We've done it all ourselves. You know, a few help, a little bit of help from uh, younger kids, and we're just looking. We're just glad we're here to teach them. Yeah, you know, kids they have their own way of uh, of getting across to each other, and sometimes it's kind of comical to you know to just kind of lean back and listen to them um, the way they approach each other. 
it, it is effective. They 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 they're easy. They they know how to get each other's attention quicker, um, in a way that uh, they can respond to. So yeah, I, I think it's a great thing having the older kids uh, kind of take the younger ones under their wing. Hello. My name is Walker Miller. I'm a senior at Breathy County High School. I work on the tiny house and I'm here to tell you about our vanity and our toilet that's going to go inside. Our vanity is custom made. It's going to have a custom bowl and a custom door. Me and a few others have did all of the water heating and the piping that goes in the back of the vanity to connect to the sink. And then our toilet's going to go over here which is also connected down there at the bottom to our hot water heater. I think the best thing about the tiny house is how we're building everything that goes inside of it. I think the one of the biggest challenges, you know, we're uh, hopefully approaching post-pandemic. I think one of the biggest challenges right now is the supply chain issues, along with getting kids back in the groove of working again. Our programs would be different, much different without the tiny house. We're really, really fortunate to have this grant. We've got money to spend on our on our students that we normally just wouldn't have. Uh, if there's like uh, a new technology comes out, like um, the outlets, it's got the USB plugs in it. I know they've been out for a while, but they're they're so handy to have in the house. So we can we can install them in the tiny house as kind of like a little added luxury, something you don't see every day. And the kids, you know, they may have never seen one, so they're getting to do this stuff and. Oh, I'd ten times rather be down here doing this than being sitting in a classroom. As it's my last year as a senior at Breath, it, it's one of my favorite things to do. I wish I could have did it sooner. It means a lot to me. I feel pretty good about it. I've worked on it this year and last year. Well, first and foremost, we want to thank and appreciate KVEC for giving us the opportunity and giving the kids an opportunity to, to build the tiny house and get and getting the experience to work on an actual construction project. And I think it's a good program for the kids to get their hands on on, what, on, on an extended learning from what we do in the shop and get it out there in, 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 a, in an actual field setting. The status of the tiny house right now is we're in the completion phase and we're probably 90% complete and we're getting ready to finish up some trim work and flooring and uh, finish uh, uh, fixtures for plumbing but we're probably maybe a week or two out before completion. Before you guys got here we were clear coating some trim in there and uh, we're getting ready to go install it this afternoon. There's a lot that I've learned working out at the tiny house, a lot that I didn't know before. Some things I've done before, like the laminate flooring, putting that in. The, the students' uh, interest in the tiny house, I don't have any student that says no, that, that wants to work on the tiny house, because they're here for a reason, and we're here for a reason. And for their experience and their knowledge as a first-year student to a senior, I mean, it's it's pretty impressive on, on what they catch up on. I'd say I'm proud of the tiny house overall because it's kind of a team project. There's not many things that I specifically have worked on without help from the other people in my class. The the bottom to top construction is really what I was wanting as a an instructor. You know, teaching them the foundation up to the roof, and you know, it being a a one year program, um, kind of fast paced that construction project but it kind of gets them in the mode of 
okay, we're learning this, then we're going to that. Then, you know, one day, one week, we're putting floor down on the trailer. The next week, we're putting the roof on. So it's kind of fast paced. The uh, correlation with N- NCCR, I f- we follow the NCCR guidelines in correlation w- also with the, the building of the house. So say we start off in NCCR with the uh, foundations, you know, then we start foundations of the tiny house. Then we go to walls, then we go to roof, and then, you know, drying it in and, and so on and so forth. But it's a more fast pace with the tiny house, so we're trying to catch up with NCCR because it's more slower paced. But it kind of works, and it, and, and, it, and it gets the students ready, actually, for both. You know, NCCR, they carry on what they learn with NCCR, and they carry on what they learn with the tiny house, and it kind of comes together, and, and they actually do pretty good with that. NCCR is their accreditation uh, program, just like, uh, uh, you know, the electrical class and carpentry follows NCCR. You know, just like automotive has ASC certification. The NCCR is certification for carpentry. They follow these modules that gets them uh, familiar and tested on, you know, foundations, walls, concrete, and stuff like that. That's their program assessment for their uh, end of the year program uh, for their uh, completion of the carpentry program. Okay, it's a nationally accredited certification for our carpentry students here at the at the school. So once they complete their uh, testing on NCCR, they get a certificate that follows them anywhere they go. So a employer can pull that up with their NCCR number and see what their their uh, qualifications are within that NCCR certification. And then it kind of gets them up uh, higher on the totem pole for hiring and and stuff like that because they're more familiar with the program. The the Tiny House has been an excellent program to get multiple programs to collaborate on. Uh, The HVAC, the electricity program, and and, and carpentry working all together to to see something, to go out and uh, say, well, I built this. But our teachers are excellent. Uh, We have uh, certified OSHA instructors here, so they can actually, as a certified instructor, they can get the cards and certification training for our students. Like I said, I want to appreciate Danny with KVEC and, and the opportunities they give us for this uh, grant. And uh, the, the kids appreciate it, school appreciates it, and we hope to continue it on here. Uh, hello, this is the PowerPoint for Knott County's number five or fifth tiny house project. This year we decided to do it a little bit different. Uh, number five, we began with a gooseneck trailer. Gooseneck trailer, the main deck is 20 feet long compared to the previous ones that were 24 feet. However, the upper portion of the trailer gives us an additional 8 feet, so we're 4 feet longer than we used to be. As you see here in both of these pictures, the metal decking in the bottom didn't go all the way from side to side, so there was a gap. So what the students are doing here is taking some silicone and putting it on both sides of the gap and then take a piece of bent aluminum and glue it in place. Here they're beginning to install the floor joist. They're using self-tapping screws to screw the two befores to the metal floor joist that are already in place. Next, they insulated the floor, um, regular fiberglass insulation. In both of these pictures, uh, you can see there's a gap on the outside edge between the, on the outside of the main frame so that those had to be filled too. Once the insulation is in we use three-quarter Advantech for our sheathing for the floor and made sure it was glued and screwed down. After that we use chalk lines to mark out the locations for our walls as we're designing the layout of this and once those are finalized we tape them off and use spray paint to make them permanent. Here you can see the walls going up. Again, the red paint on the floor is showing us where our kitchen table and our counter t- or our cabinets are going. More of the walls. You can see the bathroom in the one on the left. In the picture on the right, you see where the stairs are going. And the gray square in the back of that opening is where the washer and dryer combo is going. Then we start working on the rafters. You can see them putting some test pieces together and putting them in place to make sure they're going to be the right height and the angles are right. Then we sheeted the walls in. Uh, In the picture on the right here, you can see 
right here is one of the anchor brackets that runs, it's attached to the wall, runs through the floor and through the steel frame of the trailer. Then we move on to the exterior. Uh, we're here, you can see them applying house wrap and then they start putting the siding on. Um, better view of the siding and the windows. The siding takes a little bit of time, especially when they're new to it. Here you see plumbing going in in the bathroom and the kitchen area. Then we have wiring. This happens to be in the sleeping area upstairs and more insulation for the ceiling. Here on the left we have the covering for the wall. On the right it's the covering for the ceiling. Both of these are tongue and groove hemlock. Uh, the ones on the right obviously have a stain on them. The ones on the left, we're going to leave natural. That way, whoever buys this thing can either paint it or stain it or just clear coat it or whatever they want to do. And still in the interior, here is our fireplace on the left. There will be a TV mounted above it. Um, on the right, you see the beginnings of either our countertop or our dining table. I'm not sure which that is. They will both be made that way, like a river table type thing. And we're working just as hard as we can to get this thing finished before school is out. Here you see one of the walls that is mostly complete. And we'll update you when we're done. I'm Tommy Judd, uh, the carpentry instructor here at Lee County ATC. In this video, you're going to see the tiny house that we've built. It's a custom build for a lady. My name is AJ Maloney. I'm from Wolf County High School, but I go to Lee County ATC and that's where we're at today. We're showing off our tiny house and what we're working on right now and it's coming along pretty good. As you can see behind me, it's got the gray siding. Uh, I helped mostly put all that up and I did most of the exterior walls and it, we got a lot of people coming through so we've always got people working on it. I go to Lee County and I come over here twice a day and I stay over a little while and help on the tiny house. Mostly the ceiling and we're starting on the walls now. I help put the caulk up for the flooring, the plywood that goes in there for the floating floor to lay on. Uh, I've helped frame the walls, helped frame the ceiling. Uh, I've helped put the metal on the roof. Pretty, It's just like you've been out on construction site. That's how involved working here is. It's definitely going to be one of those things that I really miss. I, mi I will miss my instructor. Tommy's one of the best people you'll ever meet here, and um, I, I, I love the program. They want to get it done because it's theirs, and that's why I want all the students to, that want to be interviewed to be interviewed so they can, because it is their project. I'm very proud of it, and I mean, as, of a, as a junior in high school, I never did think I could build something like this. I never did think I could come and do this, but with Tommy's help and what he's taught me, I mean, I went, I went to regions. I got second place in regions. I went to state, and I done pretty good there. I mean, I like the tiny house because they get to do. They learn from the start to the finish on it. I'm taking this class next year, uh, and I, I really think I'm going to enjoy uh, building another tiny house. No, we do all kinds of stuff on it. We did the whole shabam. That started out as a little car trailer. Actually, pretty fun. Had a great time doing it. Would you do it again? Absolutely. We built a uh, 24 by 8 tiny house made from light pan. And we built it out of a special material called light pan uh, that Boxvano donated. And it's uh, hurricane proof and everything. And it's uh, really light, it's insulated, it's really easy to put up. It also has an R value of 20. They did the whole shell in about a day and a half. Heating unit, uh, heat and air unit, and everything. Everything's good with it. It does stay cool. It stay uh, keeps heat in there pretty good. So we shouldn't have no problems with all that. It was actually different for me, uh, and I know that it's going to, you know, be different for them. But uh, we still used a lot of the same things. Like we still had framing in the bathrooms, and we still had like uh, we stripped it with furring strips. Uh, those strips are still on 16 inch center soil. Uh, we had stringers for stairways. We still used wood, but uh, with the light pan, things were different. The 
electric wasn't you know your traditional wiring stuff like that it was all a little different but uh in the long run you know it's the same definitely heats easier it cools easier they brought it up here to us from uh box Vana where we did put the put the hull together and uh they brought it up here and they pulled it 60 70 miles an hour with no wobbles or anything at all and it pulls really good it's really light um we are going to end up weighing it and get an exact weight on it. It's a great learning experience. I came out here, you know, I have limited experience of what I've done because, you know, I'm not old enough to be a construction worker. Well, it's, uh, it's a great project. Uh, our students get to learn a little bit of everything from, from putting the floor in to uh, putting the walls up to, you know, just uh, stair framing, uh, wall framing for bathrooms. Uh, cabinets, floor covering. We will continue this project every year that I'm here as long as they will allow me to do it because I think the kids get proper training and several different areas that I probably couldn't touch on if it wasn't. Today we got Mr. Don Page with us from Phelps and we're going to talk a little bit about his tiny house project. Uh, how are you Mr. Page? Doing real good. We've, uh, of course, it's raining today, but uh, we've got the guys out here putting the mini split unit in today. Good. So that, that'll turn out finished. Right. I spoke with you yesterday, I guess it was, and you were, that's basically all that's holding you up uh, in the, on the final process. You got a few little things to tidy up after that, and then you're pretty well finished, aren't you? Yes. How, tell us a little bit how the project's gone for you this year. I mean, uh, some of your maybe student experiences, uh, things they liked or didn't like, and any hurdles you had with this build compared to the others, or is it just smooth sailing for you anymore? You know, you built this is what number six for you. Yeah, and this okay. one about as easy as any of them, I think. Uh, we uh, we've not had to rush, not had to work after school or on weekends or anything. We've right. uh, this one, this one's gone real good. The, uh, I would have had this heat pump in earlier, but uh, I was texting the guy that does the heat and the cooling, and he wasn't leaving in the text. So uh, oh. that that put him behind about three weeks or so. Yeah, we're, we're on schedule now. We're good. Of course, one struggle I guess now that everybody's facing, all the tiny house builders, is getting stuff. You know, if you need a refrigerator or a stove or or a split mini split unit, uh, sometimes it's hard to get your hands on it. Yes, it. Uh, our we had a little trouble getting windows in. Uh, we didn't get to use really all the windows we needed to, but, but uh, it, it's all worked out. How many of your students would you say actually contributed to this year's build that maybe have built some in the past, or you got returning students that helped, or is it pretty new crew? Or tell us a little bit about that. Uh, I've got one, two, probably. Actually, about all the seniors, this is their second second year. And uh, I've got some, it's their third year. This. But that really makes it nice, doesn't it, when you can bring that experience there. This young man right here has been how up here. Doing, man? All right, how are you? And I'll have yeah. him next year if you, go, if, you go, if you come back to school here. Yeah, what, do you, what do you think about the tiny house project? I like it. It's a good experience, and it's stuff I've always liked to do. Sure. I bet you can drive a nail, can't you? Now, somewhat. <laughs> you probably cut an angle on a board, all that stuff, can't you? Yeah, it's a great project. Uh, Tate actually uh, has got a little business started. Uh, really? He builds furniture and uh, he's built a few garages. Uh, he's he's already started doing a little contracting work. So he's and, taking. Uh, all the knowledge you've taught him and applying it in a, in a personal level and starting his own thing. Huh? That's great. Yep. Great. Yep. Little kids. Um, show us what a good program you've got there. I mean, uh, like I said, you, you're the only school that's built one every year and uh, you put out a quality product every year. And uh, we'll have a slideshow running with this that'll show some of your pictures of your build this year. And um, these are top notch. Your builds are always top notch. You got good kids there good leadership is what makes all that happen i believe and uh, I've, I've, had a, I've had about as many students that actually work on it this year as i've ever had really uh, and i got got several that are 
that are really interested and do a good job. Yeah. That makes your job easy, doesn't it? It sure does. Uh, when you got a bunch of kids, you know, take a project like a tiny house, and, uh, it gets those kids motivated to want to do things, to want to learn new things. Uh, it's just, it's amazing what it can all, when you put everything together, what a, what a really great project it can be and how it can make your position there easier, more enjoyable, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. Uh, I get students every year that tell me if, if it wasn't for this, they don't even know if they'd be coming to school. Yeah, isn't that great? I hear that every year. I guess that's why we're all as I'm as excited as you are about the tiny house project. It basically, um, until that came along, you know, we did our thing. We taught kids. You taught kids about carpentry. I used to teach electricity. We taught kids mm -hmm. how to be carpenters and electricians. But this project just really ties it together, doesn't it? Oh well, it just gives you the opportunity to do it. Yeah, um, the money that that we get to do this, it's just uh, I, I don't know what I would do without without this. Uh, grant from KVIC. I don't, I don't know how I could teach this without it. Well, it was a great opportunity for all of us uh, to get this thing started, just build it forward. You know, Desi Bowling started all this, and we're just thankful that she had the forethought to do that when she did, and that, then it can carry on now, and the kids keep getting a bit, uh, reap the rewards every year. This thing is a, yes. it's a self-sustaining grant now, and you're up to, you sold your last year's home to 39.5, I believe. And mm -hmm. I'm sure that one this year will bring more than that. We're anxious to see what it can bring once it hits the market, but yeah. we look for good things out of that. And then that gives you the money to build for uh, again next year. Yeah. Sure. And and being the sixth one, it's just gotten easier every year. Uh, of course, we, we've kind of stuck with the same design. Right. Close, especially the last two years. Uh, uh -huh. But uh, yeah, that, I'm really tickled with it. Good. And these kids are too. Well, it shows, like I said earlier, on the quality product you put out. And uh, anytime we're there, I don't know why I was over there a couple months ago, but uh, anytime we're there, the kids are just real excited about it and motivated. And just a great opportunity for those mm -hmm. kids. And to have a guy like you there leading the way is just makes it extra special, I believe, too. Well, I'm old, got a lot of experience. Yeah. <laughs> I they, they, remind, to they remind me every day how old they are. No. Old man, huh? Yeah. Well, they're. I'm sure they're appreciative of what you do there, and you're appreciative of what they do. Um, yes. 